morning, everybody. Well, speaking of that fire alarm, I, I knew in my head that I must have done something wrong today um, and that the fire alarm was only testifying to that. But, um, well, first of all, let me start out with some thanks. And um, uh, in order to uh, remember exactly who to thank, I, I actually put, that down, put it down. The first thing is you all for getting up so bright and early this Sunday. Secondly, I would like to recognize the members of the board of the SCBCC, that's, which is the organization that's putting this on, Southern California Bioethics Committee Consortium. Um, and uh, they are, would you please all stand if you're here? Uh, Dr. Miller, are you anywhere in the room? Not in the room. Dr. Wenger, I see, is here. Dr. Gorlitsky, Dr. Landis. Any of the other board members? Um, Dr. Drought, Teresa Drought. And I think that might be all of the board members who are here. Um, secondly, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the time span for putting this conference together has been close to a year. And I've been working uh, hand in hand with LMU, who are the co-sponsors of this event. So, of course, um, my thanks to uh, already to Dr. Deloro and especially also to Elizabeth Quiroz. Elizabeth, are you here? She's probably up at the registration desk. Elizabeth is, was a real trooper in putting together this event. Um, next, the uh, group which is probably new to uh, many of you in the room, and that's what's called the UCLA Bioethics Brigade, a group of undergraduates at UCLA who <laughs> helped me very much to put together this conference and are manning the front desk. You guys, would you please stand up and let us thank you. Thank you. All volunteers. Dr. Ken Murray, are you in the room? Thank you, Ken, for all the work you did with the press and for your advice to me with this conference. And um, our wonderful speakers, which uh, you will here introduced to you throughout the morning. Okay, bathrooms are outside, directly out the back doors. Let's all put our cell phones on silent and our pagers. In regards to questions and answers, uh, our plan for the morning is that we will be after each lecture, um, collecting three by five cards that, and, uh, that I will pass out to you. We will pass out pencils. And um, the brigade students are going to help me collect all those. And then we will save up the majority of uh, uh, all of those questions for the panel period at the end, which is going to be a nice hour and a quarter. If there's any immediate clarification questions, you can ask them after the sp uh, at the end of the speaker's talks, but the substantial questions we'd like to save for the end. Lastly, um, uh, you can see there the website of the parent organization for this conference, and that's SoCalBioethics.org, and you're all welcome to go there. <coughs> so it's humbling to speak about brain death, or as we'll call it in this conference, or more properly call it, the determination of death by neurologic criteria. Or if you believe that the greatest good that we can do in healthcare is to save a life, then is it not also critically important to definitively decide when we can't save a life? And there's probably no more significant way that we can say that we can't save a life than to declare someone dead. And there's one thing for sure, which is that once someone is declared dead, once someone is truly dead, there's no real medical good which may come to a corpse. We might be able to help the family. We might be able to help a fetus. We might be able to make people feel better about the passing, but we're not going to medically help that individual. So ultimately declaring death is a great declaration of powerlessness. 
the lack of ability to save that life, and that is indeed humbling. I find that the critical uh, difference between society's conception that doctors might feel themselves to be playing God is more interestingly a projection on, uh, on them rather than anything that they might want. There is a saying in bioethics that great cases are made by young women and old men. I don't actually know the origin of that. Um, we begin today's conference by considering the lives and deaths of two beautiful young women and the unique confluence of events that thrust both of them onto the world stage simultaneously approximately 13 months ago. Neither was meant to die. This one, Jackie McMath, by uncontrolled hemorrhage, which came after a uvulopalatopharyngoplasty and tonsillectomy for obstructive sleep apnea in Oakland, California, declared dead by neurologic criteria three days after her surgery, Jackie has spent the ensuing 13 months on a ventilator with a tracheostomy and a gastric tube in institutional settings in New Jersey, and most recently, reportedly, in an apartment. Interestingly, you will find that a huge trough of information on this case comes from the local paper in Oakland, where you can find a large web cache of everything you would ever want to know. A bitter legal battle ensued, and it has ebbed and flowed, providing an uncanny link to another young woman whose legacy was also a great case in bioethics, the Terry Schiavo Life and Hope Network, the foundation set up by her family, provided the McMath family an annual unspecified award, presumably to financially support her care once declared dead, because of course, insurance would not pay. How long this arrangement will last is unknown publicly. Next we have Marlies Munoz, a 33-year-old paramedic married to a paramedic who presumably died of pulmonary embolism 14 weeks into the pregnancy of what would have been her second child had they both lived. Declared dead by neurologic criteria, a legal battle ensued between her husband and the Texas hospital who believed that supportive technology could not be stopped because relevant state law requires that advanced directives for living patients not be acted upon when a baby's life hangs in the balance. The case would have been tragic enough had Marlise and her baby been removed from supportive technology at the time of her death but the confusion about her status and the applicability of the Texas law caused her to linger on supportive technology until two months later, adding tragedy to tragedy. <clears throat> Here we have a schematic of the levels of controversy that exist in our topic today. And you can see that there's, I put only three levels of controversy, but that's limited by my PowerPoint skills. If I had greater skills, there would be even more layers of controversy. And I think that one could, could certainly add here financial, and one could certainly add political. We begin at philosophical and scientific, which is the groundwork area of controversy. Here you have an odd confluence that actually lingers back to the much older idea of natural philosophy, that at its root, science and philosophy really are merged in a, in a sort of mystical bond, right? Uh, 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 and, and this, of course, affects the fewest number of people, because one has to be quite understanding in order to get into some of this uh, area of controversy. The legal controversy that exists will be largely the, um, some of the, the, the topic of our uh, keynote speaker this morning, and that affects more. And then we have the largest area of controversy, 
which affects the greatest number of people in the population, and that's sociocultural and religious. Now I want to introduce to you the problems that a working bioethicist or member of an ethics committee might actually deal with in regards to cases about quote unquote brain death in a hospital. And I, I put these all to you in terms of quotes. How can he be dead if his heart is beating? Here we have a, uh, an inference to the scientific area of controversy. But it's natural that families would bring up this concern. Why do you want to rush into pulling the plug? Can't you give us more time? As a matter of fact, one case that I remember well asked me to, family asked me to indefinitely prolong uh, supportive technology until family could arrive from a foreign country but they didn't have the money to fly in. So they asked me to prolong until family could save the money to fly in. We want you to do everything. Can't, you just can't stop now. So exactly akin to what happens in plain medical futility disputes that don't involve death, but that everything here would even encompass going beyond death. Our religious authority figure won't allow it. What I find is that there's about a 50-50% chance that family might be right about that. Uh, in that many times they estimate what they think their religious authority figure might say and they're wrong. You're only doing this because you want to harvest organs which is indeed the um, sharpest barb that we might have to deal with this morning. And lastly, you're only doing this because we are poor, powerless, disenfranchised, or a member of a minority group, and that you wouldn't treat others this way. And that also is a very sharp barb. So with those comments, um, we set the stage for uh, our conference. And at this point, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, and that's uh, Rabbi Jason Weiner. Uh, the rabbi is um, the chief of the chaplaincy department at Cedar sinai Hospital in Southern California here. He is an Orthodox rabbi and vice president of the Southern California Board of Rabbis. I'm pleased to tell you that he has a double ordination, as we say in Hebrew, smicha, and that is uh, sort of akin to having two PhDs. He also has a master's degree in Jewish history. Um, at this point, uh, help me welcome Rabbi Jason Weiner. Thank you. Good morning. I'm not so sure if it's two PhDs, maybe, maybe two masters. But it's, you know, it's great to be with you all this sun uh, Sunday morning talking about brain death. Usually my Sundays are spent with people trying to avoid talking about work with me because they don't want to get depressed by my, uh, my stories and, and the things that I do. So um, it's fun to be around people that are actually interested in this topic and want to talk about it together. So I hope we can um, all learn from each other this morning. I have, I have this PowerPoint here, but um, I don't know, some might accuse it of being a little bit of a pointless PowerPoint. There's not, there's not that much information on the PowerPoint. But... It's there, so hopefully it's uh, helpful. So I just want to share a few things about um, how the Orthodox community, how we have our approach to brain death, how we um, deal with these cases in real life, and what I think might be important for people to know um, about dealing with Orthodox Jews. And hopefully from this, not just Orthodox Jews, but anyone with religious beliefs that um, sometimes might conflict with accepted standards in, in American society. And so the first thing I want to talk about is if I'm going to talk about how we have these, these views, I want to share with you the background. And so you'd have to understand um, what the Talmud is. Actually, actually, there was a patient at Cedars this week who was not Jewish, and he asked, he wanted to know, he said, I'm at Cedars and I want to know more about Judaism. So the referral came in that he, a patient wants me to bring him the Talmud. So I said, at first, maybe let me go meet him. So I said, I said you, want, you want the Talmud? He said, yeah, I, I'm bored. I want, I want to do some reading. Can you bring me up a, a copy of the Talmud? So do you realize the Talmud is... 
is dozens of volumes. It's about 7,000 pages, and it's in Aramaic. <laughs> so he said, okay, well, maybe if you could just teach me Aramaic real quick, and you could read it with me. And he was like, he didn't give up. But um, luckily, I went on Wikipedia and printed out a summary of the Talmud for him. But basically, the Talmud is the source of Jewish law. I mean, obviously, the Torah is the source of all Jewish law. But the Torah was given in such a manner that it's sort of like cliff notes. The book, the written book of the Torah that we have is, is not really um, conclusive in itself. I mean, it's the source. It's the, it's the basis of everything. But there's so many questions that you have to know the tradition um, that has been handed down to understand how to apply the Torah. So the Talmud works in a fascinating way. The Talmud works through giving principles and case studies. Oftentimes cases that no one would ever imagine. It has cases of what do you do if a fetus from one cow is transferred to another cow? All these questions that they never could have imagined in those days and actually are relevant today. So like, for example, I think I put it, I didn't put it there, but this is a pointless PowerPoint. But there, for example, the example I give people all the time is, you know, um, the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah, we blow the shofar. So someone might ask, well, what if you have a very big synagogue? Can you blow the shofar can you, through a microphone? Now, I, I don't want to get into in denominational politics. I, I'm not criticizing non-Orthodox Jews. I'm just saying how Orthodox Jews come to their rulings. So the Orthodox rabbi would say, well, can we blow shofar through a microphone? Oh, the answer is in the Talmud. And the congregant might say, oh, give me a break, rabbi. I'm not stupid. The Talmud was written almost 2,000 years ago. They didn't have microphones then. So the rabbi would respond, well, no, that's true, but the Talmud gives us principles. So it actually has a case of what do you do if someone's coming to blow the shofar in your synagogue and they trip and they fall into a pit. Could happen. And they're in a very deep pit and they say, well, I'm the one blowing shofar, so I'll blow it from here. And you hear them blowing shofar, but all you really hear is the echo from the pit. You don't actually hear the initial sound, you hear the echo. So the Talmud says that's not good enough. You, can't, you have to hear the direct sound of the shofar. So the rabbi said, oh, that must be that a microphone is actually parallel to the pit, and therefore we know how to answer this question. That's a modern question, but we have principles going back to the Talmud to deal with this question. So in general, you know, especially when it comes to bioethics and questions we have in the hospital, I think we'll talk about this more this morning, you know, we, we believe, our, our position is that religion provides definitions. And a definition of death, which we'll get into right now, is a religious philosophical, ethical issue. Not necessarily a, a medical question. The definition of death is a religious question for a religious person. The criteria for determining that definition is, of course, a medical, medical question, and we rely on medical experts to determine the criteria. But to establish a definition is, for us, a religious question. So how does the Talmud deal with this? There's no place where the Talmud simply says, when is a person considered dead? I think it was probably simpler in those days to determine death. But there are cases where it comes up and we can learn from this. So for example, the main case in the Talmud is in the tractate called Yoma, page 85a. It says, what do you do, what happens if someone's walking on the way and a building collapses and they get trapped under the building? So why is that a question? Well, it's on the Sabbath. And technically you would not be able to dig through the rubble of this collapsed building on the Sabbath. Now, maybe today if you would. I'm not, let's, just talk, let's just go with the story itself, and we're not talking about what we would practically do today. So there's a person buried under there. We need to save the life. In Judaism, as in most traditions, saving a life overrides almost everything. We do everything we can to save a life. But we would not do everything necessarily to save a corpse. So according to the assumption of this piece in the Talmud, if we, if we know that person's dead, we would not be able to dig them free from the rubble until after the Sabbath. So the question becomes, when you're digging to find them, at what point do you know that they are alive and therefore you can keep digging? Or at what point do you assume that they are no longer alive and you have to leave them there till Saturday night? So the Talmud says, well, if you can dig up to their chest and feel their, apparently their heartbeat, then you'll know. Then it says, no, but there's another opinion. You have to dig to their nose to, see, to feel their nostrils, apparently looking for respiration. The Talmud debates a little bit and concludes the main goal is to find their nose so that you can determine respiration because the verse in the Torah says anything that's considered alive is that, that which has the breath of life in its nose. Just like God breathed life into Adam to give Adam and Eve life, so to the way life ends is when the soul departs through breath. Apparently concluding that respiration is the determinant of death. The problem is that it's very difficult to apply this to modern times, so there's two schools of thought about what we mean by respiration. So some say that what it means is complete and irreversible cessation of all vital bodily motion, including the heart. A person has to be not moving at all. 
well, I thought we only care about the nose. Well, the classic understanding of that is that, no, we actually care about heartbeat, but it's too difficult to actually feel the heartbeat through the rib cage. So the easier thing to do is to feel for, for breathing. In other words, the respiration is just a test or an indication, but that the actual criteria for death is the heartbeat. And this is how the majority of Orthodox um, rabbinic authorities read this piece in the Talmud, that the goal is if anyone has a heartbeat, that means that they're alive. The test that they did at those times was looking for, for um, breath. Another school of thought, and this was the school of thought endorsed by the chief rabbinate, which we'll talk about in, in a couple minutes, was that we, you see from here that the conclusion of the Talmud is respiration. The goal, what, mean, what it means to be alive is if someone's breathing. And therefore, death is be determined by irreversible cessation of spontaneous respiration. And once a person can't breathe on their own, they're no longer dead. When, is that, when do we know now with modern technology that that has stopped? When someone is respiratory brain dead is the term they use when their brain stem no longer continues to function because they can't spontaneously breathe anymore. So that is, that is the debate between two sides. The majority opinion, assuming that if there's heartbeat, vital motion, a person is alive. The other opinion, but no less than the chief rabbinate, is that um, the ability to spontaneously breathe is, is a definition of life. However, there's one more source. There's one more piece in the Talmud. The Talmud also talks about um, you know, when a person dies, or an animal, there's a certain type of ritual defilement that ensues and that a Jewish priest, a Kohen, can't come in contact with that object, that, that being. So it says, at what point does it begin? Well, if you would chop off a head of like, an example of an animal there, if you chop off the animal's head, then even if the animal continues to move around, you know, obviously it's just reflexes, like a chicken, I guess, with his head cut off, then it's considered dead once the head's gone. So some people call that, um, um, what's the word for it? I actually have it in my notes. I'm just trying not to look because I'm trying to be fancy. Physiological decapitation. Physio I'm testing myself. Why should I play these games? Physiological decapitation. That's what, that's what certain rabbis have called this, that they have to have complete cessation of all brain function. It's not just brain stem, but according to the, this opinion, this third school of thought, a person would have to be brain dead is considered death, but it would have to be no function whatsoever, a complete death of every cell of the brain. So some people have gone with that approach, and, they, and according to them, they do not really generally accept neurological criteria for determining death because they feel that there is some function remaining in the brain. So, so those are the three um, sort of opinions in the rabbinic community, and therefore they lead to three different determinations. One being heartbeat, if there's any heartbeat, a person's alive. The other being brain stem function, without that, a person's considered dead. The other one being whole brain death. Those are, those are the three definitions. And like I said, the majority view in the rabbinic orthodox community is that um, if there's any heart function, a person is considered alive. So in Israel, here's what happened. There's always a lot of tension between the rabbinic community and the medical community, especially because of the issue of autopsies. Jewish law discourages autopsies unless they can be used to save a life or to save a person who is currently in need of the information. And the Israeli medical establishment was very interested in doing autopsies to learn. And so the, rabbinic, the religious community frequently would be protesting against the hospitals for autopsies and, and making a lot of noise to try to prevent autopsies. So that happened. And then in the 1960s, Israel wanted to be like everyone else and be able to do heart and liver transplants. And so they began asking the question, can we do these in Israel? What do we consider to be the definition of death? And they found that there was a lot of opposition in Israeli society, not necessarily Orthodox society, but that Israeli Jews felt like this is probably not allowed. And the medical community realized, if we're going to make this happen, we need the permission of the rabbis. If the rabbis endorse this, then we could go forward. So in like a surprising move, they turned to the rabbis and they said, even though we normally work independently of you, we're asking you the question, if you come out with the permission for us to um, accept neurological criteria for determining death, then we can go forward with this um, program and save lives through heart and liver transplantation. Those are the two issues at that time, heart and liver. So the Rabbinut convened a committee of great rabbis and um, medical scholars and physicians, and they sought opinions from all over the world, and they debated it, and they came out with a ruling that brain neurological criteria would be considered death and the brain stem death, not just whole brain, but that that would be considered a valid, valid approach to determining death. But they had a number of criteria. They had to have, you know, lots of confirmation and they had to be absolutely sure and they had to have independent 
review. Included in that, they had to have a rabbi on the committee every time brain death was determined, a rabbi had to okay it, a rabbi that they approved of. So what happened was the medical establishment said, okay, we got our permission, we're ready to go. They took all those criteria and ignored them and started publicizing, guess what? We're moving forward with brain death in Israel and now we can um, transplant hearts and livers and move forward and save all kinds of lives. So the rabbinic community was, was furious. They said, wait, even though most of the rabbis at that time in Israel published um, briefings at that time saying we disagree with the rabbinut, even the rabbinut said, you're not going by our criteria. We, had, we thought we had a deal here. We didn't trust you and we gave you our trust and now you violated it. And, and so they took back, they actually took back, they, they took back their permission. But it was too late. The cat was out of the bag. Everyone said, no, they let it, they're, they're being silly and they just move forward. It actually wasn't resolved until just a couple years ago when they finally came to a conclusion and actually they, in that final, in final conclusion, the rabbinut again permitted brain death but they required a reasonable accommodation clause because they realized at that time most Orthodox Jews are not going to accept brain death, and so they had, the government would have to accept those, the fact that many don't, don't accept it. But um, what, we, what we realized, looking back on that, inc on that incident, was that the medical community and the religious community were talking past each other. They were speaking in different languages. And the terms that we use for it is that, you know, from a religious perspective, death is a status. And from a medical perspective, death is a state. And they didn't realize that they were speaking in different languages. Death being a status, you know, there's such thing as a religious status. Let's say, for example, marriage. If some, someone who gets married goes from one minute from, a set, from one status and the next minute they're in a different status. And for insurance or all kinds of things or adultery, any kind of, you know, issue that someone could do, what changed about them? They're the same human being, the same person, but because a rabbi or a priest or whoever said, you know, I now pronounce you man and wife, all of a sudden, what changed? Well, from a religious perspective, it's a status that changed. They are now in a different status. Their, their biological state hasn't changed. So death, from a medical perspective, was when does my biological state go from being alive to dead, and how do we determine that? But from a religious perspective, it was a status. And in Judaism, a status has a lot of implications. It has implications about laws of mourning, laws of inheritance, laws of the Sabbath, all kinds of things that we need to know a person's status. You know, we, we once had... Um, in, our, in our ICU, a patient who was brain dead and his son was asking the doctors, he was asking me, you know, do I start planning the funeral now? Do I begin calling my family? Do, you know, do I begin, you know, cleaning up my mother's house? What do I do now? She's brain dead, but my rabbis are telling me we don't accept brain death, so I'm so confused. So we were said, well, let's meet with the doctors and we'll go from there. We're meeting with the doctors and he says, doctor, you know, what, what's going on with my mom? What's her chances? And she thought that he was um, in denial. So she said, what are you talking about chances? His chances are death, only death. He's dead. And he just started crying. He couldn't handle it. And I had to explain to her, he wasn't really asking about what her chances of survival are. He knows that. But we're trying to figure out her status. Right now, is she his mother, who he honors and respects and spends time by her side? Or is she his deceased mother, who he now has to plan a funeral for? It was the status that the, that the problem was. And so that, that is... Um, that is what we discovered from that incident with the Rabbanut in Israel and the um, medical establishment. So the last, oh, I haven't been using this PowerPoint at all. Sorry. <laughs> I told you it was a pointless PowerPoint. And I'm now going backwards. Okay, so <laughs> backwards. That's the, way, that's the way we sometimes like to go. Oh, yeah, state for status. Okay, so now the last point that I wanted to make, well, how much, how much time do I have? Yeah, the 10 minutes, perfect. So the last two points, I'll throw in two then because I have 10 minutes. Um, if you give a rabbi 10 minutes. Um, anyways, <laughs> um, is first of all, the role of the rabbi in the Orthodox community. That's something important for people to understand, which is that a rabbi plays a role primarily of a legal decisor. The rabbi's role is not necessarily pastoral, um, even though it might be, but Orthodox Jews look to their rabbi to provide guidance on interpreting Jewish law in complicated situations. So people oftentimes put a lot of um, stake in what their rabbi says in trying to reach their rabbi even at all hours. And um, it's extremely important to people because the rabbi's ruling initiates that status that I, that I mentioned. So it's, um, it's, a, it's an important role and it's a crucial role. I'm not just saying because I'm a rabbi and I'm trying to increase my own uh, stock, but I mean, it's, just a, it's just a reality in the Orthodox community. And um, what's interesting is that frequently, non-Orthodox Jews, you know, we sometimes have a, a dilemma in the hospital. And, you know, we have three of our amazing ICU social workers here I see. 
um, Don, Stephanie, and Samantha. So if you have any questions, they're the ones that can really answer. Oh, and Diane, good to see you too. So um, anyways, they're amazing. We have an amazing team there. So what happens frequently is sometimes people will be confused. And they'll turn to me and they'll say, Rabbi, we have this family who's, you know, the patient's brain dead. And we saw that they were, you know, coming and watching TV on Saturday and they were eating their bacon burgers. And now all of a sudden, oh, we're Orthodox Jews. You know, oh, no, we don't accept brain death. Or no, we're, we have a problem with this. Rabbi, could you please help us figure this out? This does not seem sincere to me. And, okay, sometimes people manipulate things. But more often, you know, we have a reality in the Jewish community. I think, you know, it extends beyond that, but I can only speak from my experience, where people might um, not take something... So, you know, you might express their religion in certain ways throughout their life that work for them. But when it comes to certain issues that are literally life and death, they sometimes say, well, you know what, I want to be really sure about this, and I don't want to live with guilt for the rest of my life, and I also know that there's a tradition about this, and this is a pretty big deal, so I want to be careful, and I want to go according to, you know, what my tradition says about this. It might not be that in their daily life certain issues are not of a concern to them, but when it comes to such issues of such a magnitude, all of a sudden, religion becomes important to them, and that's not necessarily um, insincere, or that they're trying to manip manipulate. It actually sometimes is, a, is a, a real concern, and you know, people are going to have to live with the decisions that they make at the end of life for the rest of their lives. And a big part of my job as a chaplain, you know, and walking people through this, seeing it over and over again, is trying to ensure that they do th make decisions in a way that they will not be left with guilt for the rest of their lives, having felt that they didn't do what they could have done, they weren't as careful as possible, they didn't consider all the ramifications. So um, it's an important issue. The other issue that, um, that, that I wanted to mention, and this is actually the last one, is um, the issue of miracles, which hopefully we'll talk about as well. Because this also comes up, you know. People from a religious perspective oftentimes start talking about the hope for a miracle. And that also can become kind of like a um, standoff between the staff and the patient and their family because it sometimes seems, um, it sometimes seems futile or, um, or, or like wishful thinking, magic. So how do we deal with people, how do I ask as an Orthodox rabbi that people deal with um, this hope for miracles? So the way we tend to talk about it is, you know, distinguishing between hope and expectation. I think to have hope, to maintain hope throughout all odds is a beautiful thing and a crucial thing for many people. It's important to have hope, and you never know. There's always, people always bring up in the hospital, oh, I heard about that one time where such and such case happened, and so it could happen again. And, you know, taking that hope away from people is so devastating and um, I think so unfortunate that we want to maintain hope. And, in fact, for a patient or their family to maintain um, respectful dialogue with the medical team, it's important for the medical team to also respect that desire for, for the miracle, for the hope. So, but we don't have to have expectations of the miracle. That's where we distinguish. It's okay to say, you know, we, we hope is, it would go like this, for example. The, patient's son would say, but doctor, I think a miracle is going to happen. Can you please, uh, so we have to let it, let it go. We have to keep trying. So I would hope that a doctor would, say, instead of saying, well, unfortunately, usually the miracle doesn't happen, so let's not plan for that. The doctor, I would hope, would say instead, I also hope for that miracle. Yeah, let's, let's keep praying. And the rabbi's here, this rabbi Weiner, usually his prayers are answered. So, you know, keep, ask him to pray for you. Okay, I was joking. That, but, um, <laughs> But no, but that they would say, you know, I also hope for a miracle and um, let's maintain hope and let's keep, let's, you know, let's keep hope alive. In the meantime, what are we going to do about what normally, let's talk about what normally happens and how this might look and how we're going to plan for this reality while we maintain hope. It's okay to be hopeful and still plan appropriately and responsibly. So that's a distinction we ask people to, to, um, to make. So in summary, the three distinctions that are crucial, at least from our perspective, are um, definition versus criteria. We believe that the definition of death is a religious issue for a religious person. And in the Orthodox community, that definition is most often um, any spontaneous vital motion, which includes heartbeat, means someone is alive. Then we distinguish between state and status. That we might be talking to someone, and we're talking about a biological state. But they are thinking about a religious status. And if we're going to have appropriate communication, we have to understand the difference between state and status and recognize that they are concerned about a religious status and that's a religious issue. And then between hope and expectation, our um, distinction between allowing people to maintain hope uh, despite all odds, but while we 
are still responsibly planning for the likely outcome and um, the expected outcome, but yet maintaining that sense of hope. Hopefully later, I'll conclude now, hopefully later we can talk about, I can share with you how we um, experience reasonable accommodation at Cedar sinai is something that we invoke frequently and um, it's a big issue because uh, we have many patients from Orthodox families who don't accept brain death and so we've come up with ways of reasonably accommodating and um, it's been complicated but we have a lot of experience with that. And also if you're, if um, someone asked me to just share, I brought, I have like a booklet that I wrote about observing Jewish law in the hospital so someone suggested that if people are curious about this that I bring some of those so I have a little stack of them so if anyone wants to just ask me or I'll put them out somewhere I have about a couple with me so I'm happy to share those but anyways thank you again all for being here I hope this made sense I don't even know if I got through my whole PowerPoint I think so yep it's done so there we go so welcome thank you it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Andy Lampkin PhD who is a native of Chicago and has been teaching theology and bioethics for nearly two decades uh, Andy is an associate professor of social ethics in the School of Religion at Loma Linda University. He has earned a Doctor of Philosophy degree from Vanderbilt University in Ethics and Society, and it was actually Dr. Finder, one of our board members, who introduced him to me. Um, he has focused much of his academic career on the intersections of Christian faith, healthcare, and social justice. He currently engages in health disparities research and explores the intersection of race, class, and health care. Dr. Lampkin has uh, received funding from the NIH to better understand barriers to health research among African American Seventh-day Adventists. Additionally, he has served as an advisor and consultant to the Adventist Health Study II, a nationwide longitudinal study. Please help me welcome Professor Andy Lampkin. First, thank you, Dr. Snyder, for the uh, invitation. I'm uh, very, very happy to be here today, and I hope I can say something uh, interesting yes, to you. Uh, it's quite a challenge to talk on this subject. Uh, this is not an easy subject at all. I mean, to talk about death is just not easy. And then to talk about uh, dog dialogue and with the African American community about this uh, neurological criteria for death, I find it to be uh, quite challenging. But I'm very, very happy, very, very happy to be here today. And um, in many ways, I see my presentation as really providing some clues to talking about these issues. I don't think one person can uh, sum up the issue for all uh, 40 million of us out there, but at least to provide some clues. This is the context for uh, actually talking about the subject, in my mind, racial and ethnic health disparities, blacks underrepresented in clinical trials, blacks mistrust of healthcare institutions, and then African Americans' preference for more life-sustaining measures at the end of life. Again, trying to provide some context for the discussion and then African American spirituality. The Institute of Medicine uh, report on health disparities, I'm sure most of you have heard about it. Um, just a brief quote, although merit sources contribute to these disparities, some evidence suggests that bias, prejudice, and stereotyping on the part of healthcare providers may contribute to differences in care, trying to provide some understandings of health disparities. And what I'm getting at is African Americans have an understanding of these disparities and they have a sense of what's happening in healthcare and, it bring, and they bring these attitudes uh, with them to the clinical encounter. More than 100 published studies suggest that blacks receive lower quality health care when compared to their white counterpart. The New England Journal of Medicine, uh, there was an article published in 2002, participation in research and access to experimental treatment by HIV infected patients. And they played in this little tension, despite being overrepresented by HIV infection, 
African Americans are underrepresented in medication uh, trials. And the reasons um, that they talk about in this article, failure to recruit black participants on the part of the providers, providers claiming that African Americans are a hard to reach population. And uh, in many ways, I think they are, as well as this idea that African American patients mistrust the healthcare system. Another essay I think uh, is helpful Distress, Race, and Research, published in the Archives of Internal Medicine, found that African Americans were more likely than whites not to trust their physician, the medical establishment, and medical researchers, many believing someone like them can be used as a guinea pig. Okay, I went the wrong way. What do these studies suggest? They tend to confirm African-American suspicions that racism and bias are operative in the healthcare system. African-Americans who have experienced in a personal and institutional discrimination may be affected by concerns of continued discrimination in the clinical uh, encounter. These attitudes influence their encounter that they have with uh, healthcare uh, providers. Experiencing what are the origins of their concern and mistrust? Experiencing life in a race-conscious society like ours. Again, interpersonal and institutional racism. Negative encounters with the uh, health care system. African Americans often report very negative encounters with the health care uh, center. Experience of disparaging comments by providers as well as uh, support staff all impact uh, their views and their relationship uh, to the healthcare system. Um, then I got this little note about cultural memory. I'm going to talk about this in just a second, talk about the African-American grapevine. Uh, Patricia Turner, uh, she wrote a little book, I Heard It Through the Grapevine, Rumor in the African-American uh, Culture. I think she, her work provides uh, a context, not really a context, but her work provides at least some clues for understanding African American uh, mistrust of the healthcare system. She identifies in her work two motifs of danger that condition uh, black perspectives and attitudes towards the healthcare system. She lifts this notion of a conspiracy motif as well as a as well as a contamination uh, motif. And you've heard about some of these conspiracy, probably the most dominant, which suggests that there's this organized plot by the man or the powers to be against black Americans. And this plot includes a, a myriad of actors, FBI, F FDA, CDC, uh, and the like. These motifs of danger are spread through the grapevine through um, the rumor mill in the African-American community, and they influence uh, the cultural memory of African-Americans. For generations, uh, negative stories have been circulated within the black community about medical abuse and medical neglect by um, researchers and public health practitioners. You all have heard about the Tuskegee, self, Tuskegee syphilis study, uh, these stories are circulated through the black community and it just kind of fuel and fan the fear uh, and mistrust of the medical establishment. And again, they bring these to, we bring these to the clinical uh, encounter. Let's skip through this one, it's two actually. And here's the thing, uh, medicine has never really been a value-free discipline. Um, African Americans understand this, and uh, many others understand this as well. I think it was 1972 when the Tuskegee study uh, hit the surface. I think many, for the first time, realized that medicine has not always been uh, value-free. Medicine, like any institution in society, tends to reflect, reinforce, of the beliefs and values of the powerful uh, in a society. 
medicine and science offered medical theories to justify slavery and later the subordination of black people. They reinforced uh, societal negative attitudes that black people were inferior, something less than human, and at times justified abusive uh, medical experimentation. So this history of medical ab abuse and neglect remains in the cultural memory of uh, the black community. Again, of being redundant for a purpose, they bring these attitudes to bear in the clinical encounter. So, what are some of the present day concerns in the black uh, community? Health disparities loom large. It's, in many people's minds, just an example of how uh, the healthcare system has been uh, and is unjust towards certain populations, ethnic and racial minorities. The Tuskegee study, again, as already talked about, still talked about and discussed in uh, the black community, and it's just an example of the harm that may come towards uh, one if they ever get too comfortable um, with the health care system. Uh, condom distribution back in the, I guess it was the, the 90s or so, with the spread of HIV AIDS, there were various proposals to uh, make condoms more uh, available. But some took it as a government plot to uh, reduce black births, narrow plant. Remember that? There was a lot of controversy around it, particularly when there were some proposals to uh, really encourage, encourage <coughs> women on war, we welfare to uh, use this device. Again, the logic is here's this system and here's the man, so to speak, um, trying to uh, limit black uh, birth. Okay, there's other things that we could talk about. Sickle cell uh, screening in the early 70s and some of the discrimination that people felt around uh, these screening uh, policies. There's also a bit of fear around public immunization uh, programs. All these things, unfortunate actually. Um, and the concern is that, again, with the Tuskegee syphilis study. Uh, the concern is that African Americans were given syphilis. Uh, we know that the reports, they actually had syphilis and they were just studied. Uh, but some feel with these public immune immunization programs, <laughs> that this may be a way to infect uh, the African American community with toxic substances. So again, this is the context in my mind for uh, discussing uh, all the challenges really uh, in, in the healthcare system, at least with this population. People because people bring their baggage to the clinical uh, encounter and it informs their perception and attitudes towards uh, providers as well as healthcare uh, institutions. And again, for black Americans, this plays out mostly as uh, mistrust. Then I think what's important to note is that uh, some of these fears, and I think it's unfortunate that they hold, that the community holds uh, these fears, but some of these negative attitudes actually have their root in medical practice. So it's not completely and absolutely uh, irrational uh, as, as such. There's a certain kind of logic to it. Well, how do you respond? Providers and healthcare institutions must work hard to build more trusting relationships with the uh, black community. How do we talk to black families about death uh, and dying? The first thing to keep in mind is that there's a great deal of diversity in uh, the black uh, experience. And I'll talk more about all of these in a minute. Pay some attention to spirituality. There's this uh, belief in the sanctity of life, uh, the importance of consensus uh, within the family uh, context and authenticity or keep it real as we sometimes say. <clears throat> Relating to or regarding diversity in the African American experience, no one is just an African American, you know, despite the stereotypes. There's a lot of ethnic diversity within the uh, black community. African Americans as such trace their cultural roots to the United States and experience with slavery and Jim Crow uh, segregation. 
but also very much a part of the black community are West Indian uh, blacks and I'm married to a West Indian uh, black and there are African blacks and all these various ethnic groups, they have very different ideas and very different understandings of uh, a whole lot of different things, including uh, medicine and uh, culture. So there's a lot of diversity within uh, the black uh, community. There's regional uh, diversity among uh, black Americans, the southern, northern uh, distinction, the rural, urban uh, distinction. And all these should be at least given uh, some consideration. There are class and education or attainment differences within uh, the black community. And of course, these will impinge on one's attitudes, perceptions, uh, and the like regarding uh, health care and the very issue uh, we're talking about. And then there's a lot of religious diversity uh, within the black community. Although there are a few groups that kind of dominate, the black Baptists, Methodists, and the various holiness, or what, what sometimes termed Pentecostal groups. But there are uh, minority religious groups in the black community as well. There are a good number of people who are uh, Muslim, uh, some black Catholics, and I belong to a minority religious group, Seventh-day Adventists, and a few are Jehovah Witness. But the point I'm making, there's a good bit of diversity in the black community, and that need to be taken into consideration as we think about these uh, issues. Um, blacks who are Afrocentric, who identify with the blackness and traditional, more than likely um, will be uh, pretty spiritual. They have some notion of afterlife, this belief in heaven. And for them, when you're talking about the death, this, their deceased loved one goes to heaven and uh, looks down uh, upon us. Many blacks, and I see this in my own family, they tend to avoid the language of dead altogether. I mean, I'm not sure why. I just know in my own family, people don't use that uh, language. So-and-so passed on. Uh, we suffered a loss uh, in the family. This person is no longer uh, with us. They use language um, like that. African Americans tend to have a profound belief in the sanctity of life. Perhaps this has to do uh, with uh, their experience, their negative experiences of being devalued and undervalued and underappreciated in society, where they place a lot of value uh, on their life and the sanctity of life. Tend to believe that life should be preser preserved at uh, all cost. You just talk to people, they would kind of uh, support this notion. Blacks are not inclined to uh, discontinue life-sustaining treatment once started. They perceive this as actually causing uh, death, something to keep in mind. Not in favor of ar artificial means of terminating life, such as physician-assisted uh, suicide. They see it as sacrilegious. You don't hasten uh, one's death. Uh, attending to the spiritual as well as the physical needs of black patients uh, I think is uh, extremely uh, important as uh, providers interact with the, uh, the black community to be sure. Consensus in decision making and what I have in mind here is really in the context of uh, family. Um, African Americans tend to value people uh, in community, and again, especially within the family. Thus, to make decisions without respectfully listening to and valuing the input of, input of others is considered a, a disrespectful. Uh, all the voices, particularly of family, again, ought to, be, uh, ought to be heard. This autonomous agent that we so often talk about in uh, American society clearly relates to African Americans, to be sure. Uh, but they also have this very strong sense of, of, of community uh, and family, and critical decisions ought to be made uh, with the family uh, around. Given the fast pace of medical practice, however, people not, were not always afforded the time, uh, the luxury of time, that is, in uh, decision making. But uh, if African American a patient and their family are thrown into this kind of whirlwind, situation and they're not given the proper time to 
really think the issues through and consult with uh, other family members. It may cause family turmoil as well as uh, great uh, emotional uh, distress. Instead of have just a quick note here, it would be offensive, particularly in a uh, you know family, for one individual in the family to make a decision that um, would impact the entire family. Issues to considering to consider as providers dialogue with families on death by neurological criteria. Um, and it's just some things I'm placing on the table here. Uh, a family may not understand a brain death uh, determination, which would require um, provider education. Uh, I think these are very, very complicated things. I think as a society, we are struggling with it more generally. So if, if one is just kind of thrown or hurled into uh, a situation, it can be quite, quite challenging to think through these issues. They may not agree with the brain death determination. And the earlier part of my uh, presentation, this is really what I was emphasizing. Family may not trust uh, the healthcare system, particularly at the uh, end of life. Uh, death is forever and a lot is uh, at, stake, at stake. So all of these require, in my view, uh, patient <clears throat> education, as well as open communication between patients and uh, providers. How to create that is, is challenging uh, at times, and <laughs> I don't think it can happen at the end of life. I think we need to build ongoing relationships with uh, the black community um, and dialogue along these issues. Educating patients about death uh, by this neurological criteria. I think we need to develop better language to communicate brain death to families. Explain that the loved one uh, has no brain function and has basically passed uh, away. I think we have to admit that there's confusion around the language of, of brain death and be much more careful in our terminology. To say that someone is brain dead, in many ways it sounds like they're not really dead. Well, they're brain dead, but are they really dead? I mean, they have to, again, wrap their head uh, around that. Um, communicate that the person has lost, again, brain function and passed away. Avoid referring to the mechanical ventilator as life support. Maybe more important just to uh, describe what it does. Avoid the terminology of withdrawing life support because it may be conveyed that the patient is actually alive. If you're withdrawing life support, why would you withdraw life support if the patient isn't uh, alive? And these are just simple things, but people have to wrap their head around these uh, notions. And if you use this language of neurological death, you're surely going to have to be prepared to engage in some patient education to explain exactly uh, what that actually means. When dealing with uh, black patients, sincerity and uh, authenticity is key to building a trusting uh, relationship. And I think providers in their day-to-day -day interactions with uh, black patients, they must work to building uh, the groundwork of trust because that trust has been uh, breached, broken, and so uh, must constantly work to build that trust. So patience, persistence, and security are essential. Um, black patients are keenly aware of pre uh, prejudice and racial uh, bias, and uh, they can sense uh, differential treatment a mile away, and that's something to keep uh, in mind. So again, authenticity is extremely important, so you gotta avoid being patronizing, rushing, and I know that's difficult because uh, you work in a very, very busy context. You don't have the, the luxury that academics do to sit around and talk about issues for a long, long time. Um, but when dealing with black patients, you must devote your full uh, attention to them because uh, any slight uh, is taken as just one more uh, example of uh, the mistrust, abuse, and neglect that's, uh, that's historic in so many people's uh, mind. Take an authentic interest in uh, your, your, parent, your patients beyond their uh, health 
conditions. And again, this is challenging and very busy uh, <laughs> practices when you don't have a lot of time to really get to know your patients. But that's important for uh, African American uh, patients. They have to feel uh, comfortable with you in order to uh, open up. So you really got to work to, in my view, to get to know them uh, better. Um, communicate with black patients regarding their end of life concerns. And these, again, ongoing things that ought to be uh, done. So when we get to that point um, where you have a brain death determination, it's not so much uh, a crisis. Ex patients and families about their perspectives about end of life care and uh, decision making. So you have some clues uh, going in. Ask them, have they thought about end of life care? Who would make decisions in the, in, in the situation where you can no longer make decisions uh, for themselves? Help them think through issues and processes like uh, living wills. Raise questions about their spiritual life and whether or not they have a pastor or some kind of spiritual leader that they may want to uh, consult with um, uh, at the end of life. And then seek to understand, and I think this is a challenge, any mistrust that your patients may have and avoid, again, deeming the mistrust as irrational fears of health care, because again, they're rooted in uh, history. I think I'm going to uh, skip down uh, a little bit. Um, these are some goals I, I think that uh, we must progressively realize in healthcare and in American society. And these are ongoing issues. They don't relate. They relate directly to this, but they're, they're bigger and broader issues. Um, we're going to keep rid of these issues, as, particularly as it relates to African Americans, until we increase the number of minority medical. Uh, professionals, particularly black. We have to increase training in cultural uh, competency and continue to raise sensitivity towards these kinds of issues. Uh, engage, we have to constantly engage in better patient uh, education. And we have to deal with uh, racism and racial bias uh, in uh, healthcare, which I think is very uh, challenging. Many, again, in the black community feel that it's there uh, so we have to address it. Then I think we have to recruit more uh, minority uh, bioethicists to talk about these issues and uh, address these uh, issues. There was an article I read years ago, um, and it was dealing with this issue of race and, and bioethics. In a society like ours, an American uh, society where we're very race conscious, Bioethics as a discipline had, as a discipline in my mind, hasn't done a good enough job of talking about issues of, of race. And we need to spend much more time uh, talking about issues of race uh, and bioethics uh, in healthcare, particularly if our healthcare system is going to serve the entire uh, population in American society. Thank you for your attention. Our next speaker is Neil Wenger. Neil graduated from the University of California, Davis, in biochemistry with highest honors in 1980. Ever since, he has spent his entire academic and clinical career at UCLA, where he received both the MD and Master of Public Health degrees, and where he was chief resident in medicine, and subsequently, assistant, associate, and full professor of medicine. Since 1989, he has been chair of the Medical Center Ethics Committee, and since 2004, director of the UCLA Health System Ethics Center. He is director of fellowships in primary care research and advanced internal medicine. He is recipient of awards for excellence in teaching and the recipient of 21 research grants. Neil has published 240 research papers, and his invited presentations are so numerous as to require six single-space pages in small font. 
He's reviewer for five major journals. A recent study with his colleague of over a thousand patients in five intensive care units of an academic health care system revealed that 20 percent were receiving futile treatment at a cost of nearly $12,000 per patient. Seventy percent of these patients died before hospital discharge, and 85 percent were dead within six months. Thus, Neil employs us physicians, implores us physicians, to use medical resources wisely and to be frugal stewards of medical care. Dr. Weiner. Ron, thanks so much for the way over the top introduction. Um, uh, my, my hope today is to spend a few minutes uh, trying to link together uh, clinical medicine with ethical aspects of medical care um, to help us see some of the things that perhaps we don't do quite as well as we could um, concerning death by neurologic criteria. Um, and uh, point out areas where we might improve and perhaps come together to develop things, uh, materials that might make us better um, at this really difficult topic. Um, I come at this from a very clinical perspective, um, but a few disclaimers. Uh, I've never declared anyone dead by neurologic criteria and shouldn't because I don't have expertise in it. They'll have quite a lot of um, exposure um, to such patients, including some of my own. Um, and uh, come at this from the experience, largely, of an ethics consultant. Um, the second is that uh, most of what I'll talk about today um, is the work of others. Uh, I'll try to cite them appropriately. But sometimes I get confused about wh what I learned from whom. Um, so with that. I'll start with a case. Um, every case that I present um, at its core is real, uh, but in the details is not. Um, a man in his 50s battled a life-threatening illness and credited his rabbi's intensive assistance with helping him to do better than the physicians expected. Uh, the patient viewed his treatment as a combination of the surgery, the radiation, the chemotherapy provided by the physicians, and the dedicated religious effort undertaken by his rabbi. Um, in the midst of his illness, he presented to the hospital with a large stroke that required mechanical ventilation and agents to bring up his blood pressure. Despite maximal therapy, he developed complete loss of all brain function, proven by several clinical tests as well as a blood flow analysis. Uh, he was declared dead by neurologic criteria. The man's wife requested that the ventilator and blood pressure agents be continued uh, until their children could come and see their father later that evening. And when the children, ages five and nine, arrived six hours later, she led them to the bedside and told them that their father was doing fine. They should go home and go to sleep. They could return to see their father, who would be better in the morning. The patient's wife and family then related to the physicians that the rabbi had instructed that all life-sustaining treatment should be maintained and that any additional needed treatments should be added to keep the patient alive for another 15 hours. Uh, according to his emissaries, the rabbi was aware that the doctors had declared the patient dead, but rejected that contention. Now, the family insisted that the treatment continue anticipating the effect of the rabbi's prayer. Life-sustaining treatment could be withdrawn at noon the following day. The family insisted that the patient would want this. At noon the next day, family and rabbinic representatives gathered at the bedside to watch as the ventilator was withdrawn. This is a really complicated choreography. It involves families and external others. It involves nurses and respiratory therapists and doctors and sometimes ethics consultants. This is a very complicated set of circumstances that needs to be worked through in real time 
usually urgently. However, it's also something that doesn't occur very often. Death by neurological criteria is about 1 to 2 percent of all in-hospital deaths. That means a total across the entire country of 10 to 15,000 per year. Um, I couldn't find exact numbers uh, for the U.S. However, one Canadian study showed that about 1 percent of deaths in hospitals without trauma centers and about 4.5 percent of deaths in hospitals with tertiary trauma centers were deaths by neurological criteria. That means that a small hospital will have one to maybe a maximum of three, four, five deaths by neuro neurological criteria in a year. And a large hospital, such as UCLA, will have around 25 per year. Now we know that there's a clear relationship between volume and outcome. And how well can we do across this country doing something really complicated once a year? And not only that, but the number of people dead by neurological criteria is downtrending. And this has been known for more than a decade. These are, again, Canadian data. They seem to be the best at researching this. Um, but for a variety of reasons, including helmet laws and better neurosurgery techniques, patients who have serious and severe brain injury are less likely to die by neurological criteria today than they were a decade ago. Now, that doesn't mean that they get all better. They usually are the fodder for other sorts of ethics <coughs> consults. This complicated process of, of declaring death by neurological criteria has become increasingly complicated um, and, would, however, was very well described by, in a paper by Malcolm Shainer, uh, Teresa Drought, uh, Ron Miller, uh, all of whom are here today, um, from 2004. And I encourage you to read it. it. It rings as true today as it did a decade ago when they wrote this. And they note that after Dorothy and her house fell upon the wicked witch of the, witch of the East, and I can't sing this, um, the mayor said, as mayor of the Munchkin City and the county in the land of Oz, I welcome you most regally, but we've got to verify it legally to see if she is morally, ethically, spiritually, physically, positively, absolutely, undeniably, and reliably dead. As coroner, I must have her, I thoroughly examined her, and she's not only merely dead, she's really most sincerely dead. The wicked old wit is dead. This is a really complicated process. And they do a wonderful job of pointing it out in that neurology paper from 2004. And in fact, there have been continued updates about how one would define death by neurological criteria. The most recent, I believe, is the 2010 from the American Academy of Neurology. And it's worth looking at what the prerequisites to make this diagnosis are. Um, that there must be coma that is irreversible with a cause known, with neuroimaging that explains it, or at least doesn't contradict it, with no CNS depressants or paralytic drug effect on board, and no severe acid base or endocrine abnormality, and a somewhat normal temperature, a blood pressure of at least 100, and no re spontaneous respirations. Those are a lot of criteria. And then there's the examination, including a non-reactive pupils, Reflexes need to be absent, corneal, oculocephalic, and on. And no facial or limb movement, noxious stimuli. However, we all know that the spinal reflexes can be present, and they can sometimes be extraordinarily confusing mm -hmm. to family. We recently, in our ethics committee, um, considered a, um, a, a proposal for a study by neurologists that wanted to evaluate patients dead by neurological criteria concerning their spinal reflexes. And a major consideration was how the family was going to respond to seeing limbs jerk. Um, and what would that mean to their conceptualization that this loved one was dead? It goes on. You have to do apnea testing. And there's ancillary testing. They suggest one test is needed to be ordered only if the clinical exam can't be fully performed because of patient factors or the apnea test is inconclusive or aborted. 
<laughs> and there's many tests that could be done, including angiograms, inspect studies, electroencephalograms, Doppler studies. This is a complicated process. The same group looked at whether hospital policies included all of these components in order to declare dead death by neurological criteria. Now, to be fair, this paper was written two years prior to the um, set of criteria that I just presented. However, that was an evolving set. Um, and in fact, uh, it hasn't changed dramatically over time. What they found is that the majority of hospital policies lack many of these components of this very complicated, well-specified mechanism of defining death by neurologic criteria. Now, this is just the policy. This isn't what happened at the hospital. No one has ever done that study. The students out there, this will be a great study to do. However, for many of the important aspects um, of death by neurological criteria, hospital policies did not contain them, including the physical exam components, as well as how exactly to carry out an apnea test appropriately. This this is likely what has led to these cases that we see in the news, not infrequently. Brain dead student awakens hours after doctor suggests pulling the plug. Certainly, this patient who walked out to class a week later was not dead by neurological criteria. This is a complicated, difficult to understand, and difficult to carry out set of processes at time. So what exactly is brain death? This is just one paragraph from an article in The Atlantic by uh, uh, Richard Senelik, who um, is a pretty well-known neurologist and head of, an, uh, head of a neuro rehab unit. What's the difference between someone in a coma who may or may not improve and someone who is truly brain dead and may be a candidate to donate their organs? Brain death is the irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the all-important brain stem that houses the reticular activating system and the mechanism that controls our breathing. Dead is dead. Brain death isn't a different type of death, and patients who meet the criteria of brain death are legally dead. It can be difficult to predict a person's outcome after a severe brain injury, but it can be said with certainty that a brain dead individual is dead. So getting back to Dorothy and the Wicked Witch of the East, Shaner and colleagues say that this scene illustrates that the process of declaring death is no mere footnote, but must be legal, moral, dignified, spiritual, certain, transparent, ceremonial, and sincere. How do we do that? And do we do it very often? I believe that most of the cases that we see where there's problems, we didn't succeed in at least one of these criteria. The choreography of the diagnosis of death by neurological criteria rec requires recognizing possible death by neuro criteria and then preparing the family and then performing the diagnostic testing and then declaring death and then, one hopes, discussing possible organ donation. Reasonable accommodation, you see, is simply a footnote here leading to withdrawal of machine. I'll try to talk about each of these. How do we prepare the family? Well, all of you who are physicians, probably in medical school or at some point, learned Bog Buckman's spikes protocol. Um, how do we talk about bad news? We set, the, set up the discussion, we assess the family's perception, we obtain the family's invitation, we provide knowledge in small chunks, his term, which I love. We empathetically address emotions and we then strategize and summarize. For the social workers in the room, you can't believe that doctors need to be taught this or the psychologist, but we do. And even after we get taught it, we do a poor job. And it's this breaking of bad news and the foreshadowing that this loved one, despite everything, and despite how he currently looks, pink and warm and moving his chest, is almost certainly dead. 
doesn't get communicated. And we don't have good, readily available materials for this either. How does one educate about death by neurological criteria beyond the, the conversation? And I actually asked some of you in the audience and many in our uh, LA area, what gets handed out to a family to prep them or to help explain to them? And we, don't have any materials at UCLA, and virtually no one, except for a couple hospitals, told me that they had anything readily available. So I searched a bit and actually found an absolutely wonderful description of brain death from Brigham and Women's in Boston. Now, whether this is available at any reasonable price, I'm not yet certain. But it goes through in great detail how one understands brain death and what it means. It then goes on to say, does anyone ever recover from brain death? And sadly, no one has ever recovered after being declared brain dead. What does brain death look like? And it takes us through what it means to actually be brain dead. Brain dead, not a term that we would like to use, but they use here. Patients look asleep, but they're not. They don't hear or feel anything, including pain. This is because the parts of their brain that feel, sense, and respond to the world no longer work. In addition, the brain can no longer tell the body to breathe. Because the brain cannot control breathing, breathing must be done by a machine <laughs> called a ventilator. As long as the ventilator is working, the heart will keep beating. You may see a brain-dead patient make movement. These movements are reflexes. They are not because the brain is working. I can think of a number of cases where a brochure such as this would have been quite helpful, especially really early on. This is something that we might consider developing as a community. We might tweak it a little and make it different, but I bet it would be a wonderful educational addition to the way that we handle these cases, especially in a hospital that has to do it once a year. Most of the places I was able to find good materials explaining death by neurological criteria were organ donation websites and organ donation handouts. And in fact, I found very few other than those put out by an OPO. What does that mean? What does that suggest to the patient and the family? That we declare brain dead for a particular reason. And here's another example. And I could have 40 examples of the best materials all on OPO websites. So case two, in February of 2014, you guys, uh, the, the date is not lost, right? This is immediately in the aftermath of uh, the McMath case and the case in, uh, in uh, Texas. An 18-year-old male with a gunshot wound to the head gets transported to our, our neuro ICU. Uh, despite emergency surgery, neurologic status deteriorates and the physicians suspect that the patient on a ventilator and receiving pressors has died. The family refuses the apnea test to diagnose death. Can they? Should they be able to refuse an apnea test? It's impossible to treat a patient unless a clinician knows whether the patient is alive. Dead patients don't benefit from treatment, as has been pointed out here numerous times already today. If a patient isn't to be transferred elsewhere to receive treatment, and I would parenthetically say, even if they are, that hospital is going to want to know whether an evaluation for death has been performed. But even if not, then I would posit that a brain death evaluation must be performed. One cannot treat this patient ethically without knowing their status. And therefore, consent is not needed. The best practice would be to inform and perform. That then leads to the disclosure of death, which the Shainer paper says should be direct and clear with veracity, enhancing the communication. Now, Dr. Lampkin pointed out that the words we use are very important. I frankly would have avoided saying passed on, but maybe I need to change the way that I now communicate 
with certain groups. In fact, one of the questions that I would like to hear addressed is how do I know what words I'm supposed to use? We try to avoid euphemisms and jargon. A family needs to hear that their loved one has died. But we must disentangle the death declaration from organ donation. Now, we're already told to decouple. Those of you who are involved in these cases know that there is a decoupling between the death declaration and the discussion of organ donation, with the organ procurement organization having the responsibility for that discussion. I'd like to say that we must go further than a simple decoupling, that it is our responsibility to ensure that there is no confusion between the declaration of death and the opportunity to donate organs. If the family creates the linkage, it's a different story. Certainly, and perhaps most importantly, is the role of spirituality and ceremony around a death declaration. Our pastoral care, our spiritual care individual within our hospital ought to be front and center. Perhaps even taking the most important role of interacting with the family and helping to prepare them. In no way should we be abdicating the physician's role to foreshadow and to declare death and make it clear. But it may very well be that we should have a minor role in this entire conversation with our pastoral care representative playing the bigger part. Now I'd like to pr uh, present to you a study, maybe some have seen it, but I had not until uh, Joseph Rajo, one of our fellows, uh, brought it to me, um, that I think tells us a lot about what happens after the declaration of death or around the time. Um, and um, helps us to better understand accommodation. Uh, this is a study from the Cleveland Clinic they looked at 13 ethics consults for family requests of continuation of physiologic support after death by neurologic criteria between 2005 and 2013. Uh, they evaluated patient characteristics, the reason for the request, and the time of the accommodation and outcome. Now, I'm going to show you a slide that's difficult to see, but I'm going to walk you through it. These are all 13 cases. I think if I speak loudly, feel free if I walk over to the slide. Am I OK? So here's 13 cases. They range in age between 14 and 87. Most are for strokes or tumors. There was one suicide attempt. One person found out. Some horribly tragic cases of an amniotic uh, fluid embolism after a C-section. And a young 14-year-old with a post-stop event causing uh, cerebral ischemia. That sounds anything like a case that we've done recently. In one of our cases, and one um, traumatic brain injury. Um, these patients' families requested accommodation <coughs> for very different reasons. What is accommodation? Leaving the machines in place while the patient is dead to accomplish some goal. Four of them wanted the family to gather. And in fact, as we'll learn shortly, um, uh, this is one of the specified reasons that we in California are supposed to accommodate. Um, one of them drew out the time on the machines, uh, indicating that they wanted to think about organ donation. Um, one of them was angry um, about the outcome, as would not be difficult to understand, a 31-year-old now dead after a C-section. Um, in that case, they were especially angry, as described in the article, because the families didn't reveal that they knew that the patient was dead for quite a long time. Um, one of the case, they, they were waiting for a miracle. And in five of the cases, uh, they disbelieved that death by neurological criteria was death. Um, there's one other uh, uh, case that I didn't discuss, 
And that's the case where they disbelieve the doctors in general. Um, and it's very important to distinguish between disbelieving the physicians and not believing that death by neurological criteria is death. And that's one of the things that we, from an ethics perspective, need to carefully tease out in trying to understand how to assist in a case. You can see how long the accommodation went on. In most cases, it was well less than 24 hours. However, I do need to point out that there are the two longer cases, more than 75 and about 125 hours, that have asterisks by them. In those two cases, the families refused to allow a death declaration to be made because they refused the apnea test. The outcomes are shown. In a couple of the cases, the heart stopped on its own. In most of the cases, the families arrived or through conversations. They, uh, the team with the ethicists were able to work through to get to a resolution where there would be withdrawal. Those two cases without the dec death declaration were transferred to other hospitals. Just a comment on that. What an absurd proposition that we would permit the use of life support machines, in quote, in death to reasonably accommodate, but refuse to permit the use of life support to maintain patients in a persistent vegetative state. Difficult to get my mind around. But that's what we do. If we transfer a patient elsewhere on machines propagating a death state. The types of requests for accommodation the authors of this paper put together as finite goal accommodations, usually emotionally driven or practically achievable. All, almost all these patients, um, the accommodation lasted only a couple of hours until people could arrive, and they were virtually all accommodated within less than a day. Um, family arrival, emotional closure were the main factor. Indefinite accommodations, their term, usually based on trust or beliefs, but most commonly not accepting death by neurological criteria as a reality, often required more than 24 hours. How we handle these two types of accommodation is of tremendous importance. And it does require us to balance respect for the patient's belief, reducing the family's grief, and addressing emotional needs with our professional standard, the moral distress that we cause, especially among the respiratory therapists and the nurses and the social workers, respecting the dead and the care and resource needs of our other patients. A third case, an 82-year-old woman sustained a massive stroke that was not amenable to treatment. Over two days, she progressed to death by neurological criteria. <laughs> the family asked the ventilator be maintained until the family arrived from Asia a week later. Uh, the medical team explained that this would be attempted. The unit was not full. Uh, it didn't, wasn't a lot of work. Uh, the patient had Medicare, so they explained that charges would accrue to the family starting the next day since you can't bill Medicare after death. Uh, the ventilator was withdrawn. So how do we approach accommodation? Um, I think we need to address accommodation at the outset. Make it a, a level playing field. Let families know that we have a responsibility to accommodate. And in fact, for specific sorts of accommodation, we will make every attempt to do so within our ability. Discuss what reasonable means and set limits. Clearly disclose what our hospital policy says, and what we won't do. This, of course, requires intensive support of the family, including all the team members in agreeing to this. Otherwise, you end up with very unhappy team members often acting out that unhappiness in ways that contributes to more difficulty for the grieving family. But I can see no ethical justification for continuing physiologic support of a dead person without a finite goal. So this choreography 
requires many things of us as hospitals, as clinicians, as ethicists. It means that we need to empathically break bad news, to foreshadow, and hopefully to provide written materials, maybe that we can develop together. It means rigorous testing per guideline has to be performed and is, can't be refused. It means forthright disclosure and anticipating accommodation in advance, separating organ donation from death declaration, and setting a plan for withdrawal. This is what we will do. This is when we will do it. So lastly, in reprise of case number one, um, this case, I believe, was poorly handled by the clinical ethicist, and I can say that because it was me. Uh, there is little doubt that the patient would have wanted the treatments maintained and escalated to permit a chance for a miracle. And the finite request was made for less than 24 hours. It would have been into the Cleveland Clinic's criteria. However, continuing physiologic support for this patient served no medical purpose, made us complicit in harming his children, compromised our professional standards, grievously disturbed the nursing staff, and led to a crisis of faith when the man did not breathe when he was excavated at noon. To Dr. Wenger or others who think of them now so that cards can be passed. Our next speaker is Thaddeus Mason Pope, attorney, PhD. Am I not audible? Am I audible in the back row? Thank you. He graduated in philosophy from the University of Pittsburgh with highest honors and Phi Beta Kappa. He graduated from Georgetown University <clears throat> as an attorney, but also with a PhD in philosophy and bioethics. He clerked for the U.S. Court of Appeals of the Seventh Circuit and practiced corporate law for seven years before joining academia. He has taught at the University of Memphis, the Widener University School of Law in Delaware, and is now associate professor and director of the Health Law Institute of Hamline University in St. Paul, Minnesota. Thad was on the program committee of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities for the November meeting in San Diego, and he is chair-elect of the section on law Medicine and Healthcare of the Association of American Law Schools. He helped draft most medical orders for life sustaining treatment for Delaware and now co chairs the Pulse Physician Orders Task Force in Minnesota. He has over 100 publications, <laughs> writes a regular column for the Journal of Clinical Ethics and is co-author of a legal treatise on end-of-life decision-making. His name, Thaddeus, means courageous, generous, and kind. And he is not only wise, but also the most productive individual I know. Thad. Thank you, Ron. I hope I can move up a lot. Um, <clears throat> So I think I might have a few extra minutes, so let me just indulge me for a second. Um, how many people here are physicians? Wow, okay. Nurses? Uh, chaplains? Social workers? Um, what else? Students? Well, a lot of students. Pharmacists? Oh, you're not even a farmer? You just, okay. <laughs> Anything else? All right. Huh? Oh, right, of course. That's the <laughs> Physician, like Neil could raise his hand twice. Okay. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, 
Oh, I did want to say, I, I, uh, th there's a slide, these slides are, well, actually these slides are not in your packet. I sort of kept tinkering with them, and so I've deviated away a little bit. Um, they're pretty similar. If you want the actual slides that I'm going to use, which are going to deviate a little bit from in the packet, they're on my website, ThaddeusPope.com. Um, and I want to just especially thank um, you for inviting me <laughs> in January, because I am coming from Minnesota. <laughs> I am an attorney. Uh, this is a New Yorker cartoon. I am a member of the legal profession, but I'm not a lawyer in the pejorative sense. <laughs> and it is nice to be back on the uh, LMU campus. I used, to, I used to come here once a year. I used to practice um, in, in Century City. Um, once a year for, there's a business ethics competition that they'd hold here, and I'd come to be a, a volunteer uh, judge for the business ethics uh, teams. So here's my, here's my road map, and I'm going to proceed in uh, three stages. First, I'm going to describe uh, legal duties after the termination of death by neurological criteria. I'm going to provide a history of the 2008 California Accommodation Statute, and then I'm um, going to jump in and really look at what that statute requires of clinicians. So the determination of death by neurological criteria, or, or brain death, right? This was first articulated back in 1968 by the Harvard Committee. And, and in their JAMA article, uh, the Harvard Committee predicted that, and this is a quote, no statutory change in the law should be necessary. Uh, well, this was absolutely wrong um, because clinicians are really legally risk averse. They wanted clarity. And during the 1970s, states across the country aimed and, 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 and tried to provide this legal clarity. Unfortunately, they took five different approaches, right? So we had five different types of law uh, for the determination of death in different states across the country. So in 1980-81, in an effort to get uh, uniformity, the President's uh, Commission for the Study of Ethical Problems in Medicine uh, drafted a standard, right? And so this is the standard uh, that's pretty much the law in every state now is an individual is dead it's either or an individual is dead who sustained either irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions or irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain right and this was after the president's commission uh, drafted this this was then became the uniform determination of death act more recently in 2008 the president's council on bioethics reaffirmed the standard. And the council referred to the cessation of all brain function as total brain failure and equated that with death. So this, this has been legally settled since the 1980s. And in fact, it remains settled, at least legally. Uh, brain death, and, and, I, and I'll just say that we're not supposed to use that term, but uh, I don't want to keep saying determination of death by neurological criteria, is <clears throat> legal death. Um, this has been adopted in all 56 years, jurisdictions, although I'll come back to talk about some exceptions. And it's not just the United States. There is a durable worldwide consensus in just about every developed country on Earth. Clinicians do not need family consent to stop physiological support. Why? Because once dead, the individual is not a patient. If they're not a patient, then there's no duty to treat. There's no physician-patient relationship. There's no treatment relationship. All treatment duties are turned off at death. So just a couple examples. The American College of Physicians Ethics Manual states that after a patient is declared 
brain dead, medical support should be discontinued. Locally here, the LA County Bar Association, LA County Medical Association Joint uh, Committee said that once death has been pronounced, all medical intervention should be withdrawn. And this is the rule almost everywhere. It was the California rule for 34 years. But there are some exceptions represented here. But before we get to the exceptions, I want to quickly uh, recap uh, the legal status of brain death in California. So brain death was first adopted as legal death in 1974. That was codified in the Health and Safety Code. And then uh, in 1982, California amended that to adopt the new Uniform Determination of Death Act language, which was codified in the same section. But at the same time in the 80s, other states weren't just adopting brain death as legal death. They were also uh, discussing and adopting accommodation requirements. Now, I'm going to discuss New York, New Jersey, and Illinois because they have uh, laws. But even though other states don't have any legal requirement to accommodate, it is a pretty common practice across the United States to provide some accommodation in the face of uh, objections, from, as we saw from the Cleveland Clinic study, because Ohio doesn't have a law, but they accommodate nonetheless. So let's, let's start uh, in 1986 in New York. Now, uh, at this time, 1986 in New York, we had a bill passed through both houses of the New York legislature, passed the Senate, passed the Assembly. This bill was going to provide an exemption, uh, for a religious exemption to brain death. And what I mean by exemption, as distinct from accommodation, is that the individual can basically opt out of being determined dead by neurological criteria, right? So you say, I'm only, in other words, you get this, you say, I'm only dead if I satisfy the criteria for cardio, cardiopulmonary death. Mm -hmm. Even though I satisfy the criteria for neurological uh, death, you're not dead legally. So it passed the legislature, but the governor at the time, Governor Cuomo, did not want to sign it. But he also didn't want to veto it. So he directed the State Department of Health to develop regulations um, as an alternative to this legislation. And that's what happened. Those regs state <clears throat> that each hospital in New York shall establish and implement a written policy, a procedure for the reasonable accommodation of the individual, individual's religious or moral objection to determination of death by neurological criteria. So this is, this is the basic rule here, which is if you're dead, there's no duty to treat. But what New York uh, did with the regs is they changed the right side of this conditional. New York actually, so normally there's no duties to treat after death, but now because of the New York regs, uh, there are. But I do want to flag three limits on or in the New York regulations. First, it gives a lot of discretion to hospitals to write their policy. It doesn't tell them how to write it, just says write a policy providing reasonable accommodation. A lot of uh, delegation and deference given to the hospital. Second, the only objections that count are religious or moral objections. Uh, Dr. Lampkin talked about a lot of other types of objections from mistrust and not believe in the diagnosis. Those don't count in New York, just religious or moral objections. And, and third, the only, the only needs to be a reasonable accommodation. So this is not, what the it's not an exemption, which is what the, the bill in the legislature is going to do. It's just an accommodation, weaker. OK, jump forward up to 1991 now to New Jersey. 
What New Jersey did was basically what New York originally planned to do. It provided a complete religious exemption. So again, just to contrast this, New York provides an accommodation. You are dead when you satisfy the neurological criteria for brain death, but you have some ongoing rights. In contrast, in New Jersey, if, if you can make a, a, a claim for the exemption, you're not even dead. You're not dead, even though you satisfy brain death criteria. So the New York, uh, sorry, the New Jersey statute uh, provides the death of an individual shall not be declared on the basis of neurological criteria when the licensed physician has a reason to believe that such a declaration would violate the personal religious beliefs of the individual. So just to contrast New York and New Jersey here, remember New York changed the right side of this conditional, New Jersey's changing the left side. Um, so the, the conditional is still valid as a, as a basic uh, rule, um, but New Jersey is basically saying you're not dead, and therefore there is a duty to treat because you, you negated the precedent of the conditional. New Jersey changes the definition itself. Just to flag one tiny implication of this, it does help assure payment, as, as Dr. Wenger noted, right? If you're still alive, which you are in New Jersey, you can still get health insurance uh, reimbursement, which is not true in New York, because while there may be a duty to accommodate, you are legally dead. Now, while the obligation uh, to continue support appears open-ended, it's not indefinite. Cardiopulmonary death normally follows brain death uh, rather soon, as, as uh, Alan Schumann's uh, studies have shown. Now, I just want to flag two limits in the New Jersey law. First, it only applies to religious objections. And secondly, it only applies to religious objections of the individual not the family. You have to show that, th that this would violate the religious beliefs of the individual. And at least that was tested, at least in one uh, court case in New Jersey, uh, which denied an exemption because the family was unable to establish, violated their religious beliefs, but they were unable to establish that it violated the religious beliefs of the, of the individual in the hospital. All right, now jump forward now from 1991 up to 2007. Now to Illinois. Illinois uh, this year enacted a statute uh, which provides that every hospital must adopt policies and procedures to take into account the patient's religious beliefs concerning the patient's time of death. This might be the weakest of all, th of all three, right? New Jersey provides a complete exemption. New York says you must uh, provide reasonable accommodation. Illinois says just take it into account. Since 2007, after 2007, uh, the push for accommodation has been actually more in the courts than in the legislatures. Uh, we have at least three uh, litigated cases, one in Massachusetts, one in uh, D.C., and one in Michigan, all asking for religious accommodation, and all were denied. But one other uh, thing to keep your eye on, this hasn't really been tested yet, is that many states across the country have been enacting Religious Freedom Restoration Acts, RIFRAs, right? You, this, you got, this got a lot of attention recently because of the Hobby Lobby case. That's the federal RIFRA. These are state-level RIFRAs. Now, as I just walked through, you have four states, we didn't get to California yet, but we have, you know, we have four states all together that have accommodation requirements specific to brain death. But you have a whole bunch more states, the yellow states, that have RIFRAs. And what a RIFRA does, basically, um, and it's not, again, it's, it would be open to any sort, any sort of religious objection to any sort of <clears throat> law, um, is that you can demand exemptions from generally applicable laws, like a brain death law, that substantially burdens the objector's religious practice. Um, these, these are getting you know, a lot of attention lately because they're sort of being misused in a sense because people are 
asserting religious objections, uh, you know, to serving uh, homosexuals or you know, things like that. So it kind of was deviating from the original intent. Um, as far as I know, it hasn't been applied in a brain death context. So before I get to the California law, let me just step back and look at the reasons why families ask for accommodation. Um, and I think both Dr. Lampkin and Dr. Wenger uh, got into this a little bit. This is a little bit of a recap, although they don't have any colorful poetry from the Wizard of Oz. Um, but I do have the Sleeping Beauty. So brain death, brain death is a, is a tough, it, it is, it's a tough diagnosis to accept, right? Because the patient is still warm and, and they're breathing. And going all the way back to the 1840s you know, with Edgar Allan Poe, there is a long-standing fear of misdiagnosis. There is, and this is uh, Liam Meeson's uh, ex-wife, or former wife, first wife, you know, there is massive uh, confusion over what brain death means, because you have the media uh, literally saying things like this, she's brain dead and being kept alive on life support, right? So not even, you know, it's not the public's fault even. And the diagnosis itself is being seriously questioned in the scholarly literature and in the media, right, with the Jahai uh, McMath case, right? And just a few months ago, right, her, her lawyers um, filed a writ of error quorum nobis, right, basically, you know, seeking to revoke her California death certificate. And that's not unique. Right, the front page of the LA Times has carried other stories of errors uh, in the diagnosis of brain death and in death generally, more recently with this case. And there are a lot of these cases once you start looking. Uh, and they have a high profile. You have uh, authors like Sanjay Gupta, um, you know, sort of collecting these cases <clears throat> in books like his book, Cheating Death. And then you have a whole different set of cases. Again, there's a number of these, where people are worried that death may be, this is uh, right, the case from San Luis Obispo where, where the, the allegation was that the transplant surgeon hastened the patient's death. The transplant surgeon isn't even supposed to be in the same room as the patient until after the declaration of death. So this case, and a lot of others like it that are currently being litigated still, um, people are worried that this is, again, a fabrication just to get their organs. Now, again, none of these concerns carry legal weight in New York, New Jersey, or Illinois because accommodation is required only for moral, or relig moral and religious objections. So let's turn to those, right? We have stories like Lazarus, Right? There's a big, this is doc, well documented in medical literature, big belief in miracles in the United States. So religion is the big uh, cause, uh, need for accommodation. And, and basically, there's four uh, types of religious assertions or claims for accommodation. Um, some of the Orthodox Jews, Japanese, Native Americans, and Buddhists. So what I want to do is look at the history of accommodation law in California. Uh, to, to trace the history here. So let's start in 1983. That year, you have a, um, a local court, local to here, um, from uh, a case out of Loma Linda University, the court basically permitted the hospital there to stop physi physiological support despite uh, the objections of the parents, the uh, uh, baby's parents. But the court went on uh, to make some extra commentary in that case. The determination of death by neurological criteria does not mean that the hospital or the doctors are given the green light to disconnect a life support device from a brain dead individual without consultation. We are, meaning the court, uh, appellate court, we are in accord 
with deferring to parental wishes until the initial shock of the diagnosis dissipates and would encourage other healthcare providers to adopt a similar policy. Now, this was not a part of the holding of the court, it wasn't essential to the, the, the legal question that was presented to the court. So, at, in 1983, it wasn't really binding, just the court giving its opinion about stuff. So, move forward then from 1983 up to 1986. Here, uh, Assemblyman Katz introduced a bill that uh, was drafted by Agudath Israel, who, who, by the way, drafted a lot of the other bills, the Illinois bill and bills in other states. Uh, this bill would have provided a religious exemption uh, to, to brain death. Basically, it would have made California pretty much uh, following the same rule as New Jersey, but the bill failed. The following year, Katz tried again, uh, but this time the bill wasn't an exemption bill, now it's just an accommodation bill. So now it looks more like New York instead of like uh, New Jersey. And that bill also failed. So by 2008, uh, Katz had left the assembly, but brain death accommodation was picked up by uh, Assemblyman Mike Eng, who used to represent the district in East, East LA. Eng introduced AB 2565. Uh, and unlike the Katz bills, AB 2565 was passed and signed by Governor Schwarzenegger and then codified as Health and Safety Code 1254.4. So this is what I want to talk about now, is 1254.4 because that is the source of legal obligations to accommodate objections to brain death. Basically, this made California a lot like New York, although the California law is broader than the New York law. So remember, uh, in, in New York, hospitals in New York only have to accommodate moral objections. The California law does not have any such limit uh, that, that, it, that the only objections that have to be accommodated are moral objections. So I want to look at the, two, at the duty separately. Um, in other words, I want to look at first the duty to accommodate non-moral objections, and then, after we do that, then to look at the duty to accommodate moral objections. So take them one at a time. So non-moral. And our, our question here, our question is, what does 1254.4 require of hospitals? Uh, in answering this, and this is sort of like a little bit of a, for the non-lawyers, uh, a little bit like a little law school lesson here. There are four places we can look uh, to figure out what the statute requires. We looked at the text of the statute, the words in the statute, Look to the legislative history, what was the legislature thinking? What were they trying to accomplish here? And look to custom and practice, what are hospitals doing? And then to courts, how courts have interpreted the language of the statute. So four places we can look. So first, the plain language. Well, the, the statute addresses two types, or two, not two types, sorry, addresses two aspects of accommodation. What do you have to do? And how long do you have to do it? Well, on the first, the, the statute's actually pretty clear on this, on what you have to do. It says the hospital's required to continue only previously ordered cardiopulmonary support. No other medical intervention is required. Now, the text is a little bit less precise on how long uh, this has to be done. It's pretty good, though. It says you have to provide this for a reasonably brief period. And then it even goes on to tell us what that means. That's the amount of time afforded to gather the family or next of kin at the family's bedside. And it does give us another, uh, another limit, which is in determining what's reasonable, a hospital shall consider the needs of other patients and prospective patients in urgent 
need of care. Basically, if, the, if, if you need that ICU bed for a living uh, patient, then uh, the implication is you don't need to provide it to the brain dead patient. Now, the statute recognizes there's still a little bit of vagueness here in what reasonably brief period is, but it, it, it lets hospitals decide, right? Because in, again, it's saying draft, adopt a policy for providing the family or next of kin with the reasonably brief period. The legislature delegated to hospitals, giving them deference and discretion to define what reasonably brief period is. In addition to the text of the statute, the words in the statute, we can look to the legislative history. AB 2565 originated, um, there's, there's a contest in, in, in Assemblyman Eng's district uh, called the There Ought to Be a Law Contest. So people you know, write in, there ought to be a law about this, there ought to be a law about this. Well, the winner of that contest that year um, it was about brain death accommodation. So the, the constituent's mother had experienced a severe stroke. The patient was eventually diagnosed as neurologically dead. Uh, but the physician took 15 hours to notify the family about this. The family was then given only three hours uh, to pay their final respects. At this time, one family member was out of town, and the family spiritual leader couldn't be contacted in that three-hour uh, window. So to address this case, this is the prompt for the bill, to address this case, um, early versions of the bill, AB 2565, suggested two days. Also, in determining the economic impact of imposing an accommodation requirement on California hospitals, the legislative staff um, assumed that the accommodation would be one day because they had to figure out they figured out an annual cost of $6,500 uh, dollars, uh, for every 24-hour period, multiplied that by um, the frequency in which people, they thought they'd see these cases. But anyway, they started with an assumption that it would only be a 24-hour accommodation period to figure out what the economic impact would be. Anyway, so that's just to give you a sense, people were thinking 24 hours, 48 hours. Third place to look, got text, legislative history, is custom and practice. When a statute, California statute, uses a term like reasonable, right, we look to conduct, like we do in a med medical malpractice case. What would the reasonably prudent physician do in such a case? And again, um, there's delegation and deference here, right? The hospital gets to write its own policy. And a number of Southern California bioethics uh, committee consortium members uh, responded to a survey um, and I'm not an empirical researcher, but I, my, my, my interpretation of the survey results is this, which is um, over 70% of the respondents accommodate for 24 hours or less. And only a few um, accommodate for 48 or 72 hours. So a couple other places to look. In the Jahai McMath case, which was litigated, so there's a lot of public documents, Children's Hospital of Oakland represented that they usually accommodate for two days, sometimes three days, although they did, they accommodated for eight for Jahai McMath before being ordered by the court to, to accommodate for another 15. In fact, Children's Hospital of Oakland had another big public case uh, just right before Jahai McMath um, where they accommodated for a week. All right, so that's, that's accommodation of non-moral objections. So I want to look then at the duty to accommodate moral objections. And again, we look to the same four uh, sources to figure out what, this, what the statute requires. So plain language. Here, the statute requires reasonable efforts uh, to accommodate special religious or cultural practices and concerns. And note that uh, these, this is different from New Jersey uh, and New York because what you have to accommodate are the practices and concerns not only of the patient, um, but practices and concerns of the patient or the patient's family. 
Now, that makes the California statute a little bit broader. Uh, now, it's not drafted as an exemption, like an indefinite accommodation. Um, it, it's drafted as an accommodation requirement, which is um, more definite. In fact, uh, I think uh, this is Neil. I think Neil called this out uh, as an absurd proposition, um, and that is that if 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 this were interpreted to require an exemption or an indefinite accommodation, that would be a little bit of it would be absurd. I call it perverse um, because California has <clears throat> uh, a separate uh, law uh, in the in the probate code, so-called you know re resolution of medical futility disputes. So. If you have a patient, for example, a permanently unconscious patient um, with other comorbidities, um, many hospitals in California have futility policies that they act on um, where they think where they're going to go ahead and unilaterally <coughs> withdraw uh, life-sustaining uh, treatment over the objections of the, uh, of the family if they can't get consent. Well, that, would be, that seems a little bit perverse. That uh, you have to, you would have to cave in and, and indefinitely accommodate religious objections for dead patients, but you, you wouldn't have to uh, for living patients. Third, um, we again see here in the religious accommodation section that there's there's delegation deference uh, to hospitals because it doesn't tell you it says write your policy. It's giving them some discretion over exactly how to write it. But when I read, I read and I read the statute a number of times. It does seem to require more than just the reasonably brief period to gather the family. Um, why? Well, because a, a standard rule of statutory interpretation is that you have to give meaning to every word in the statute. You can't read it in a way that renders any words, phrases, or clauses superfluous. And when you look at 1254.4, you have separate duties articulated in separate sections of the statute. So they have to mean, has to mean something different, because if you think, well, that just means provide them the reasonably brief period, then, then, then C would be rendered you know, meaningless. So it has to mean something different than A. Or they wouldn't have written, the legislature wouldn't have written it. We assume they don't do stupid, I mean, they, they do, but we assume that they don't uh, do stupid things when they write statutes. Now, the only guidance provided in the statute itself as to what, what, this, what you're supposed to do here is a, is a limit that, again, in determining what's reasonable, you can consider the needs of other patients and prospective patients in urgent need of care. So text, not super helpful. So let's look at the legislative history. Now, first thing to remember is that the 1986 bill failed. And if you really, and you go back to the 86 bill, which I, I might have put in the packet there. If you go back to the 86 bill, one thing is, if you really wanted to provide an exemption, an indefinite accommodation, you, would have amend, you wouldn't amend 1254.4, you'd amend 7180, which is the Uniform Determination of Death Act. You'd change the very definition of death to provide a religious uh, exemption. That's not what they did. That's probably not the way to interpret 1254.4. Second, the duty pertains only to accommodating, quote, special religious or cultural practices and concerns. Okay, what's that? Well, it's telling that if you look at the early versions of the bill, it didn't say special religious practices or concerns, it said rituals. Um, which, which I guess suggests that the accommodation duty may not even be about continuing physiological support at all but only allowing the patient to uh, perform rituals in the hospital within the reasonably brief uh, period. So in addition to the text, in addition to the legislative history, you can look to custom. And here, what I, what I think is useful to do is to look to New York, actually, because here, California and New York have a very similar rule, which is you have to provide a reasonable accommodation of moral objections. So. They have a longer history. They have more of a track record. Let's see how they've interpreted it. That's not binding in California, but it's persuasive. The largest public health system in the maybe the world, but in the country, um, is New York New York City uh, Hospital and Health Corporation. Right? It has these eleven big public hospitals. Their policy says we will provide reasonable accommodation, but generally not to exceed 
72 hours from the time of pronouncement. So reasonable accommodation for a religious or moral objection, not more than 72 hours. And there have been a number of litigated uh, cases in New York which sort of confirm that only a few days is required. Um, in this case, it was uh, they provided five days. The court said that's good. Um, and similar in, a, in another case. Now, continuing physiological support, so the duration isn't the only way to accommodate. Um, and one other type of accommodation is, is transfer. Um, and it's, you know, in context here, transfer is a standard way of, of resolving uh, family clinician disputes, right? So you think of in the, in the probate code for futility disputes, have to try to transfer. When clinicians, the exact opposite of the, of, of the family, when the clinicians assert a conscience-based objection, well, how do you, you have to try to transfer? Right, so that it's a standard way to, to try to accommodate and resolve these disputes. And it's the way a number of cases actually turned out. Uh, the Jesse Kuchin case, right, these patients are transferred often home because no other hospital really wants these cases. Um, but, but, they are, but they are transferred out of the hospital. Um, in fact, there was a, another, a case here in LA that was the, the resolution was to transfer home and of course, more famously recently in, in Oakland, Jahai McMath transferred out of the hospital. So if you can transfer, that's one way to accommodate. And finally, um, to get a sense of what 1254.4 means for moral objections, you can look at court rulings. In the McMath litigation, the family asserted religious grounds for accommodation. And as you'll recall, the court denied those requests. They made a number of different types of requests, right? They, they requested continuing physiological support. That was denied. Even when they were planning to not try to get Children's Hospital of Oakland to continue uh, with Jahai in a, in a uh, transition to a focus on transfer, they needed, they needed a trach for the transfer. The court wouldn't order uh, Children's Hospital to do that either, right? So none of the accommodations, special things that, that they wanted, for moral reasons they asserted, were granted by the court. Um, and again, as far as I know, this hasn't been tested in the brain death uh, context, but one other place to look <clears throat> in determining what reasonable accommodation means in 1254.4 is um, Title VII and also the Americans with Disabilities Act, right? Because these, for, for decades and decades, right, when you have somebody who doesn't want to work on Saturday because of their religious faith, right, you, you, that term, religious, or I'm sorry, reasonable accommodation has been built into these general uh, anti-discrimination laws for a long time. And so we have hundreds of cases interpreting in many different contexts what reasonable accommodation means. It's a great place to look to to get some guidance on what the same exact term means in California statute. Am I doing okay on? Okay, so let me let me just um, make a couple other comments. One is that the McMath case illustrates something else, and that is that whatever legal duties the hospital actually has under California law, the family can usually get a TRO, a temporary restraining order preliminary injunction. So recall the case, again, Jahai, about a little over a year ago now, a year and a month. So she had been declared brain dead. The diagnosis had been confirmed by three clinicians at Children's Hospital of Oakland. But mom wouldn't accept that, couldn't accept that. Now the hospital provided an accommodation um, from December 12th up to December 20th, which time they, they thought, well, this, we've already provided an accommodation longer than our normal period of two days. <clears throat> so that we've kind of reached the edge of our accommodation period. So mom then gets a temporary restraining order from the Alameda County Court. Now at first, um, the, the dispute was focused on this. 
mom just wouldn't accept the diagnosis. She didn't believe that the clinicians at Children's Hospital Oakland were right. She's not brain dead. You're wrong. Okay, so um, the TRO now lasts from the 20th up to the 24th. <clears throat> then we get um, an independent neurologist to come in from Stanford who confirms the diagnosis. Okay, she really is dead now. Okay, so that basis of dispute is resolved. But the TRO is now extended from the 24th up, up to January 5th while the family makes other arguments. We say, okay, even if she is dead, we still have other, other reasons why we want you to um, continue physiological support. And just to kind of, I don't want to go through their arguments, but just to give you a sense here, 1254.4, it's a California state statute, okay? So in the scheme of, of law in the United States, it's sort of near the bottom, meaning it's preempted if it conflicts with the California state constitution, with a federal statute, or with the US constitution, right? All sorts of higher forms of law. And basically, the McMath case had, had asserted <clears throat> a number of claims, at least in the, in the federal law, there was a state lawsuit and a federal lawsuit. They had asserted a number of claims in the federal lawsuit, basically saying, 1254.4 conflicts with um, these other forms of law. Uh, now, since she was ultimately transferred to New Jersey, um, you know, the, the case was dismissed, so the claims were never, never adjudicated. But litigation is slow and cumbersome. So just to take one other example, there's a more recent case than McMath, just from 2014, um, in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, Isaac Lopez. So again, the family challenged, like McMath, challenged the validity under the Constitution, the validity of the Kentucky Brain Death Statute. They lost, um, but it takes time for the court to make the ruling, okay? So just, even though they lost, even though their claims were sort of meritless, you still had a TRO for 20 days, right? So the, I guess my, my, my point here is even when you have no legs to stand on legally, you can still get a TRO um, 10, 20, 30 days until the court figures out that your claims are meritless. So just, to, just then to conclude, accommodation requirements uh, in California very clear, the statute only requires that you continue cardiopulmonary support. Have to permit rituals to the extent, you know, that it's safe, uh, you know, for other patients in the hospital. Um, if it's not, and to use the, the, the statute doesn't use this term, but to use the Title VII term, basically you have to permit the rituals so long as it's not an undue burden for the hospital uh, to permit them. Normally, I guess the period, the custom and practice, legislative history, period, probably around tw just 24 hours. Um, and not even that, if there is a, a living patient who needs that ICU bed. Now, everything I've said is just the law, right? It's just a floor, okay? Um, and so, Absolutely, many facilities go above and beyond that, and they should, and you should maintain flexibility and sensitivity uh, to respond dynamically to the circumstances of each particular case. Thank you. I want to thank Paul Schneider for inviting me to moderate this important discussion. I'm Malcolm Shaner. I'm a neurologist practicing at Kaiser Permanente West Los Angeles Medical Center. And I'm the physician director of the bioethics program at Kaiser Permanente Southern California. I'm also a co-author on the determination of death guidelines from the Council on Ethical Affairs of the California Medical Association. We know that this is the last presentation, and we expect to get you to your lunch and to the rest of your day promptly. Earlier in the morning, uh, we had uh, an, some excellent discussions uh, that provided some exploration of examples of how some in our diverse communities appreciate the determination of death by neurologic criteria. In this next approximately one hour, we're going to invite the audience and the panelists 
to clarify a few of the uh, points that were made earlier and also we hope to offer additional perspective. Now I have a list, I mean it's a big list of questions here. So I uh, hope no one will be uh, inflamed if I don't get to your particular question. I plan to ask a question as well to start off the program. However, I'm told that we also have a microphone that's available. Oh, and if you can see in the back of the room, what is your name? Richa. Richa? Richa. Richa. I can't hear you from down here. Oh. Richa. Oh, thank you very much. Richa. Does it work? Oh, good. Hello. Oh, there you go. Richa. So we can see that that microphone works well. Please make use of it uh, if you'd like. I also have an announcement. Some people have requested to see the PowerPoints from some of the people who did not submit them. Those will be uploaded to the website and you'll be able to get them there uh, at your discretion. Uh, one other thing, when you use the microphone, please introduce yourself and your affiliation before you ask your question. All right, so I'm going to start here and uh, I'm going to address this to anyone on the panel, but I think first uh, I'm going to address it if uh, I can give first right of reply to Professor Roberto Del Oro, who's the director of the Bioethics Institute here at Loyola Marymount. It's a little bit of a frame question here. Uh, it says that an expert panel of the World Health Organization has defined human death as permanent loss of capacity for consciousness and all brainstem functions as a consequence of permanent cessation of circulation or catastrophic brain injury. This is for all death, not just for the termination of neurologic death. Now that's from a philosophical and a biological standpoint. But the question asks, but what of a theological and anthropological approach to death? Can divergent moral traditions come together over questions of moral substance? Or is our endeavor today an empty exercise, leaving us no resort except to the courts and the judiciary area, which have their own problems with this? I'm supposed to <laughs> <laughs> I just say uh, briefly, uh, I, I think uh, I was told that there was a question like that going on for me, but I thought it was a joke. <laughs> and so I, I think it's, a, it's an extremely uh, difficult question to answer. And so I, I have to start thinking about that now. Can you use the mic? Um, uh, there, we need a microphone a little bit as Dr. Deloro, uh, uh, Professor Deloro. So I'll, I'll make the, the following uh, points. Uh, first of all, I think we have to distinguish the level of our own considerations. <coughs> As it was pointed out at the beginning by, by, by Weiner, uh, there is a difference in defining death and a difference in defining the criteria, the clinical criteria for death. So the definition of death is not immediately uh, the expertise of clinicians, but in fact it belongs to a larger understanding of what does it mean to be dead in relation to a certain understanding of life. So one could say that perhaps using a distinction that has become uh, customary in a certain version of uh, philosophical reflection, uh, we could distinguish between understanding death and explaining death. So it seems to me that the clinical criteria are an attempt at explaining the reality of death understood as a biological reality. But to understand death uh, entails a passage to an entirely different level. And I think uh, Dr. Limkin 
had also addressed the fact that our own understanding of death is always framed within a matrix of very complex uh, dimensions that pertain to the uh, cultural, the philosophical, and the theological as well. So one could say that the two different levels cannot enter necessarily in conflict with one another because they operate at different levels. So um, the question of how we are going to bring people to an understanding of the explanation of death is a function of all the kind of attentions that, for example, Dr. Neil brought up as essential to addressing the predicament of families, the uh, possible uh, surprise at the death of a loved one, as well as the grief of a family. To come together in understanding uh, how to think about death, well, that's, uh, that's a much more complicated affair. And I'm not really sure that is actually possible. It is possible to converge in dialogue around our own different anthropologies. And I think a conversation about the diversity of anthropologies is certainly a conversation that is very needed and a conversation that is very important. I'm not sure that the purpose of this dialogue ought actually to be necessary the ability to come to a consensus. Uh, so that's as far as I would go with my, with my response. Um, I want to add one, one thing, and that is in bioethics, there is the presumption that we can operate on the basis of a fundamental set of common principles. Right? And so bioethics speaks of the so-called notion of common morality. One of the problems that have been recognized, however, in the common morality of the four principle approach is that we don't have necessarily any clear anthropological framework to adjudicate the prevalence of one particular ethical principle over another. So uh, I would say the explanation of the criteria for death is something that we can certainly carry out on an objective basis, the dialogue on our own understanding of death is something that we should carry out without necessarily hoping to arrive at a consensus, because obviously it is a much broader kind of a problem. Would any of the other panelists like to uh, respond to the uh, question? <laughs> And there we have, it. well, it's the most difficult question then, isn't it? Um, the next is for Andy Lampkin. Oh, and by the way, please feel free if uh, uh, you have a question that's burning to use the microphone, but I'm gonna go through the questions otherwise. Um, so, someone noted that uh, there was a slide that was skipped, Professor Lampkin. Sure. It had to do with conflict resolution and how clinicians ought to be approaching uh, the bedside uh, African-American family when they have questions of this nature. <coughs> Wondered if you could walk us through that conflict resolution process. And, and again, it may have been a missed slide, so I apologize if the question wasn't clear. Yeah, there, there were two sli slides that I uh, skipped over, and one of them had to do exactly, well, actually, they both had to do with the conflict uh, resolution. And I was going to uh, raise a caution uh, oftentimes, I think institutions have written uh, these uh, conflict resolution policies to uh, address this tension when uh, providers uh, and patients, their views, their values uh, collide, so to speak. And so, then we have these hospital policies to, in many ways, to trump the discussion. And we need something there. We really absolutely need something there. 
the caution that I was going to lift uh, in the slide is that we have to be mindful uh, that sometimes when we turn to hospital policy and evoke hospital policy where our policy is this, now I get it, we have very few options, uh, but for certain communities, it just comes across as a power play and a power move. And for a community that already has issues with trust, it just deepens the distrust. Um, that's what the slides were getting at, but I thought I would skip it because it's a lot of complexity. Complexity. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I'm keeping with the questions that are directed to specific individuals. Uh, I had a, a couple of different questions that I'm going to try to put together for Rabbi Weiner. Um, it starts out, well, one question is, how do Jews choose amongst the Jewish definitions of death, since there are multiple? And then uh, this has to do with, uh, I think, a formulation from that question at the bedside, which is given that the Rabbinical Council of America has left a judgment on the halakhic status of neurologic death to individual rabbis rather than the, as the Israeli rabbinate said, it is consistent with halakhic law. Are there steps that physicians, attorneys might take where an individual rabbi urges a grieving family to demand continued medical interventions over the moral objections of physicians, the law, and perhaps other rabbis? Um, so the, to the first question, you know, as I pointed out, there are different possible ways of understanding the Talmudic texts that have led to three definitions of death, but that there is one that is the sort of majority opinion, which um, requires complete cessation of all vital motion, including heartbeat. Basically, the way that we decide these questions is not, um, you know, one time someone called me, you know, I, I, I mentioned that a person who's a Jewish priest um, can't come in contact with, with, the, with the dead or even be in the same general area. So one time somebody called me and he said, I want to know, I got a job working in the pharmacy at Cedars. That pharmacy is in the lower level, which is where the morgue is. And I'm a Kohen, I'm a Jewish priest, so can I take the job? So I felt, you know, I felt my first reaction was, you know, he can't take the job, but I don't want to ruin his livelihood. I felt I should consult with a greater rabbi than me, which is not hard. I mean, just pick any rabbi in the yellow pages, then you can find that. But so I, I thought, you know, let me consult with someone. With someone. Um, so I called a certain rabbi in Los Angeles who is known as someone who, who people call about these questions. And I called him. I said, can someone take a job who's a Kohen, who's a Jewish priest in the lower level at Cedars? And he said, that's funny. Did so-and-so just call you with that question? <laughs> I, I, I said, yeah, how did you know? He said, oh, because he called me five minutes ago. I said, no. So now he's calling you to see if you'll say yes. So I called him back, and I said, my answer is the same as Rabbi so-and-so. And, uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so I mean, it's not appropriate in Jewish law to you know, shop around. People call it, that's called you know, shopping for the leniency. We don't just ask around who's going to give us the answer that we want. And, that, and that's why I was kind of being general on purpose, because we believe that everything is a case-by-case -case decision to be rendered by a rabbi who is an expert and can deal with that specific case. One thing I left out when I mentioned that um, rabbis in the Orthodox community are, in a, in, a, in a way, legal decisors. It's not just pastoral role. It's a legal decision-making process. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I meant, neglect, neglected to say was that many, many, you know, these rabbis are to be, these questions are to be determined by experts and not every, just by being a rabbi, and I don't consider myself an expert necessarily in this field, but just by being a rabbi doesn't make one an expert in these areas. We turn to certain rabbis who we believe are experts in the area and they're able to help us through those cases. So we don't, we don't um, just pick and choose and if someone asks their rabbi and their rabbi helps to determine um, the appropriate approach for that family. How about the, the, that was about the rabbis, I know that we went right, right over to that. What about for Jewish families? What should they do? Should they be careful about which rabbi they ask the question of, or how do they decide? Um, I mean, it is true that most, most Jews do not have a rabbi to turn to. Um, I, I've noticed, if I were to guess, in my experience at Cedar sinai we have a lot of Jewish patients there, and um, I would guess that 80% of the patients that I meet um, have no rabbi to call if they, if they to turn to. They're not members of any synagogue. I'm not talking about Orthodox and sort of Reform. I'm talking about zero 
affiliation. Um, so typically, that, that ends up being the role of a chaplain in the hospital, that when someone has religious questions and they don't have a religious community to turn to, then they bring it to the chaplain, and the chaplain hopefully helps them in accordance with their own values um, to help to determine what's the most appropriate thing. Sometimes they do want to know what does Jewish law say, and so we have to turn to who the chaplain has to help make a decision who's the expert to turn to. Um, you had asked about the, the RCA. I don't know, that's obviously a very specific question. Whoever asked that question was, uh, uh, was knows something that um, probably beyond most people, but the RCA is the Rabbinical Council of America, which has not necessarily made a specific ruling on that. That's the largest orthodox, well, I don't know if it's the largest. Maybe it's tied with the largest, with the Gudas Israel, but the, one of the major orthodox bodies, and they sort of don't take a stand on the, on the, on the position, but they um, recognize the challenges with determining death by neuro neurological criteria in Jewish law. And um, so they, they, um, they also deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go on to the question for uh, Dr. Wenger. Um, and this is, it says, uh, while families often request non-beneficial treatment, clinician-generated non-beneficial treatment is common. <laughs> how, how can we encourage clinicians to diagnose neurologic death promptly and also to act in a manner consistent with the diagnosis of death, to use the words you were talking about? Um, I definitely would agree that uh, much, perhaps most, of the medical waste uh, sits at the, uh, at the footsteps of clinicians, mm -hmm. almost, all, almost all physicians. Um, whether much of that occurs uh, in patients who are dead, um, I, I doubt. Um, and in fact, it's not so clear to me that a lot of these cases um, the problem is delayed diagnosis. Um, every every uh, academic center uh, can talk about a case this year that got transferred in who was dead when they hit the, the doorstep. Um, but that usually was not because the uh, other hospital um, was missed the diagnosis. They simply didn't realize that this patient was dead when they transferred them. Um, I guess I... I think that that question uh, assumes that there is a lot of late diagnosis going on, and I don't know if that's true. Is there a question? Oh, yes, I do. Please. Um, good afternoon. My name's Kateri Harnito. And I'm from San Antonio, Texas, the university health system there um, as an ethics fellow. It's, it's a brand new program. So, and I want to as, as express um, a thankfulness that you approached this from a, addressing religious and moral objections. My be first career was in hospital chaplaincy and I, so I dealt a lot with this. Um, um, these questions when their loved one was dying or was brain dead, down in San Diego in particular. I didn't address my question to a specific panelist, so I thought I would ask, and I'm kind of mo I'm moving this into a, uh, some specific, I'm seeking some specific information about the Mc McMath case. Um, this last summer I attended a seminar up in Wash at University of Washington on healthcare ethics and was told this piece of information that I, you know, i hoping somebody can verify or tell me that I was led astray. You know, when, when the physicians had declared the patient brain dead, I was told that the patient, patient's body actually had been sent to the morgue and then was returned to the patient room and somewhere along the way intubated and, um, I, probably so many people in this room already know all of the the step-by-step -step occurrences with this case, but I was in another state and, and it didn't get as much publicity as I would have wanted it to so I could know what was going on. Does that sound familiar in terms of the facts of the case? I think your question is, was the patient taken to the morgue and then returned to the ward? Is that the question? Returned back to the, the family insisted that she was not dead. 
Is that but, right? That's my understanding. The, but the, the I have been the, told that by the hospital that the hospital staff had actually declared her dead and removed her from the room to the morgue and had to return her body to the hospital room. Right, and you want to know if the fact if that was accurate. Right. I don't know if everybody here knows can, that. Can anyone uh, answer the factual and, nature? And, and maybe just identify what the dynamic was with this family and who was. If you if you don't know that answer, maybe you could at least fill me in on who was trying to tell the family that that their daughter was brain dead and what what fell down in these communications or was she brain dead? I can confidently tell you I know nothing uh, about what exactly happened um, more wow. than what was in the, say, the newspapers. But no one gets transferred to a morgue while still on life-sustaining treatments. And during the time it would take to get down to the morgue and back up again, rigor mortis would begin to set in. So it's highly unlikely that that occurred. I, I would confirm that. Also because... Well, I have on my website all the court, so there's quite a lot of court papers, declarations from five, six, or seven different clinicians at the hospital. So the history of the case, not just in the newspapers, is well documented in the, in the so litigation record. So you have it on record. your website? Sorry? You have it on your website, Dr. Yeah. Oh, great. So, um, so a lot of exhibits in the court papers. Um, but, but remember, they, um, they accommodated, and then as soon as they informed her that they were going to stop accommodating, she got a TRO, and so they wouldn't transfer it to, her, to the morgue, right, and be in contempt of court when the court told them not, you know, to continue the life-sustaining treatment. So I agree with Dr. Wenger. I don't know, never heard that, and I suspect it's incredibly unlikely that that actually Most happened. Most likely, yeah. I thought it sounded out incredible, too. Thank you very much. I'm just going to follow up, though, and just ask, does anybody know who at Oakland was dealing with the family in terms of trying to describe a <coughs> catastrophic neurological deficit the patient had. Uh, I, I would uh, like to abbreviate this part of it, not uh, out of uh, respect, but all of the information that we have is, is not uh, of a confidential nature, and it's from reports from newspapers. And um, correct me if I'm not wrong with the panel, but I don't think anyone uh, should be able to answer that question, and if they have the confidential nature of the information, they should not answer the question. So I must apologize for that. Please, if you know it, don't answer it. <laughs> so I have a question for uh, Professor Pope, uh, and that is, uh, it says, in California disability law, a demand for reasonable accommodation may not be required when such a demand poses an undue hardship. Uh, I, we did not see the language of undue hardship in this discussion. Would continued medical interventions over years for a patient neurologically dead constitute an undue hardship on physicians, hospitals, and California society. Uh, where do we draw the line with that, that uh, reason? Right, so that's the undue, undue hardship is <coughs> the, the definition of when something becomes an unreasonable accommodation. So once, it, once, once it, making the accommodation would become an undue hardship, then the accommodation is not reasonable, therefore not required. Um, so to answer the, the, the question specifically, right, if, if, if it's gonna be for years, that, that may be an undue hardship. That's, well, we, Dr. Wenger already framed, these are pretty rare, 1% possible deaths. Um, the number of those that are gonna end up uh, lasting years is an incredibly small subset of that subset, right? I mean, McMath, um, and there's cases in, in all the, Alan Schumann is at UCLA, right? Is, some, in the Schumann papers, he's done this, what, what I think he calls, his term is called a chronic brain death, right? Incredibly small number of cases that last even a month, and definitely uh, way, way even fewer last uh, per year. So in the, in the vast majority of brain death disputes, it's gonna be a lot tougher to say um, that it's an undue hardship. Why can't you do it for two weeks? Um, why is that an undue hardship? Um, I think that's that's a tough, uh, tough, tough uh, case to make. It, 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 the, the best you presented, where it's going to be a year, two years, like in math, then, then the argument that it's an undue hardship becomes a little bit more compelling. And oh, I mean, this is a related 
question for just one second, if you don't mind, Ron. Uh, it says, when does Medicare and other payers stop paying claims after a declaration of brain damage? It relates to the undue hardship on the Medicare payer. When does Medicare um, I, stop paying I claims? Hope. <coughs> and I think Dr. Winger mentioned this too. I don't think Medicare pays for anything after the declaration of debt. So that's actually one big, uh, it, it, it is, comes up a lot. So New Jersey, right, you're not dead, and therefore you can continue to get Medicare payments because the nature of the way in which the accommodation is made is to, de is to delay <coughs> the declaration of debt. In New York, um, in fact, sometimes people ask, well, instead of declaring debt and then providing an accommodation period, people would ask the hospital, can you just delay the declaration of debt so that we can continue to get a source of reimbursement. If you're going to continue physiological support for 14 hours, please also delay the declaration of debt. Because we, we don't want to have to actually personally pay out of pocket for that 48 hours. So generally, no payment after that. Dr. Wenger? Um, I wonder if we could ask, I think David Blake probably knows more about this than the rest of us. Can we ask you to tell us? Yeah, so I, so I don't know of any ruling for Medicare specifically on this topic. My hunch is that across the country, hospitals are variable on whether they have to actually submit to the patients after the forms of the and In some instances, it might affect their DRB case because Medicare is paying them for hospitalization and their certain diagnosis. So there's probably instances where Medicare is paying for some of that hospital care after diagnosis. I know there are cases where commercial Microphone on. Uh, commercial insurance companies have uh, paid for care even where a patient has been transferred home and put under home care. Insurance companies have continued to cover the care for the same reasons that hospitals would accommodate demands for it, that is for public relations reasons and the like. So, so, but could I ask a question since I don't know. <laughs> question immediately followed by your question unless this is an immediate follow-up to what it, we're it is it actually it is about it is about uh, the cost and that is you well, know, Ron, like would it be all right if uh, David asks his question as a follow-up of course excellent, excellent. <laughs> so would the panelists consider it unethical for a hospital to aggressively pursue collections against a family who had insisted upon a continuation of care where the cost of the hospital could be substantial would it be unethical for a hospital mm -hmm. to go after a family, um, aggressively, let's say, uh, to recover the cost of that care where the family insisted upon treatment beyond the point of a confirmed diagnosis of pregnancy? It's a free for all. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would um, say that uh, there are costs and they need to be paid. And therefore, it would not be what I would find to be unethical, and I would guess probably fraudulent, is to delay the diagnosis of death to pretend that someone is alive. Uh, I, mean, I, I agree. I mean, although I would watch on the adverb aggressively, right? Because I think, like, you know, for most, most hospitals are nonprofit, and we did amend a couple years ago, we amended 501c3 with 501r basically to kind of federal law to sort of cap down on the aggressiveness with, with uh, which hospitals go after the deaths. I would just say that, you know, I wouldn't consider it unethical, and I do prepare families with this very often, like that you have to realize that certain point might come where you have to raise tens of thousands of dollars to treat someone who the hospital believes is not alive. So I, I would, so we understand that it would have to happen, it's a reality, but at the same time, I certainly appreciate, and I, this I see it frequently at Cedars, I'm sure elsewhere, how much the hospital is often willing to cover the costs and allow families this accommodation. And um, it's definitely something that's very appreciated and quite a beautiful gesture when it happens. All right. Uh, Dr. Ron Miller, who's been waiting very patiently for us. My hearing is impaired. And it may be that you have already suggested that my question is out of order. 
If it is, I will change it to a hypothetical. But my question to the panelists is, do we know whether Johnny McMath is still demonstrating movement and other functions that the family <coughs> interprets as living. And <clears throat> if that's the case, or even if it isn't the case, many of us have worried that such cases clearly demonstrate the <coughs> myth of total dysfunction of the brain. <coughs> There are functions that continue. And she's an unusual patient or <coughs> corpse. And <coughs> the question is, have we learned enough about her status to have any implications for perhaps a redefinition or <coughs> a change of criteria? for the diagnosis of death by neurologic criteria. I say neurologic rather than neurological because I am not clear why we use neurological as opposed to neurologic, which makes better sense to me. Uh, yeah, and just uh, I want to respond only to the first part of the question. I'm not even trying to enter either in the semantic dispute or neurological or neurological or in the actual clinical question. But uh, um, I was curious as to what had happened to Jay McMahon a couple of days ago. And I went on the uh, on internet and there were a couple of uh, YouTube videos which I think are from December 2014 in which the mother shows, of course, backing up his evidence with the notion that Jai is still alive, that uh, um, the, the, there are movements in the foot of the of Jai as well as in the head. And uh, so that is what what you see on, on YouTube. Uh, what you can infer from that, I don't know. It and indicates a hip. Spontaneous <laughs> reflexes that are completely uh, understood as uh, due to the fact that the person is kept on bed for 14 days. Don't say anything about the fact that the person is alive, but just an answer to the factual question you were asking, that's what you see still on the internet. Someone else wrote. wants to respond to this. Um, so there's, now there's a big literature, right, that even though you're dead, uh, diagnosed as dead, right, there's still a lot of physiological things that the body can still do, right? So we know that you can gestate a fetus, because that's the Marlis Munoz case. You can grow, there'd be cases of people diagnosed dead at, at three years old, and the body grew from three year old up to 20 year old, right? So your body can grow. There's lots of things that the body still does, um, even though you're dead. And so into high, you know, you can do those things too. Um, what, what the McMath case, let's see what happens with it, uh, potentially, potentially might do is something that, that's never, ever happened which is there's never been a case where somebody was correctly diagnosed as dead and then later wasn't dead anymore. That's never happened. Um, and with the, with the confirming diagnoses, not just from the Children's Hospital clinicians, but also from the Stanford clinician, right, and, and, and the court ruling, right, he sort of this confidence that Jahai was correctly diagnosed as dead in December 2013. Um, so if there's a a lot of neurologist declarations submitted in October, <coughs> but they're, they're, um, if we get new declarations uh, and, and she is determined to not be dead now, that we're going to have comment to say, right? That's sort of a big deal because it's never happened before, <laughs> and we're already having this debate about the status, this this, this 
diagnostic uh, category, um, and this is just going to throw that yeah. door even wider open than it already is. Yeah. By the way, I, I was not suggesting that she's a liar. Oh, no, no, it was just that. No, no, I, yeah. Yeah. But if I might add, I'm sorry on this, because I want to enter into another uh, issue that perhaps might be pertinent. I would be very interested in knowing from uh, the rest of the panel what to make of the clinical meaning of some of those phenomena which uh, very esteemed neurologists seem to have from the interpreting the research and have used as a basis for disputing the neurological criteria, one for all, certainly uh, Dr. Schumann. Um, and I'm saying that because this kind of, let's say, doubt at the clinical level has generated also a lot of doubt within, for example, the Catholic community. And I want to speak to that very briefly. It's quite obvious that the magisterium of the Catholic Church has expressed most clearly the notion uh, in connection with the issue of transplantation that the neurological criterion ought to be considered an absolutely uh, perfect criterion for the determination of death. Uh, this has been the case with uh, uh, an affirmation by John Paul II of Brazil in the year 2000 at a, a conference in the Transplantation Society there have been also statements, actually three statements, by the Pontifical Academy for the Sciences, uh, 1985, 1989, 2006. And yet, <coughs> because of Dr. Schumann's and someone else's objections to the neurological criteria, a doubt about the plausibility of the neurological criteria <coughs> the availability of patients who have given consent to transplantation has been thrown into, into the community as a doubt that has created a lot, of, a lot of issues. So I wonder whether the larger neurological community, scientific community has come up with a sort of uh, univocal criterion for responding to the objections of people like Schumann or whether we should just say, well, the scientific community is still divided. It doesn't seem to me that the scientific community is divided, that there is, in fact, a kind of overwhelming consensus with, however, some dissenting voices. The epistemic status of those dissenting voices is not clear to me, and I'm concerned that uh, it might uh, generate increasingly doubts within the community, I'm speaking, for example, about the Catholic community, as to the certitude of the person's death. So I notice that people are looking at me. Uh, technically, I'm the moderator. I am a neurologist. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I was going to avoid these questions like this. Um, it's okay for you to answer that one. Okay, thank you very much. The chair of the program has given me brief permission. <laughs> Um, you, you know, uh, Dr. Schumann has been raising these issues for many years, and that's why Dr. Posner at the Pontifical Academy in 2008 addressed all the cases that Dr. Schumann had reviewed and found that there was, again, as you cited before, no case of neurological death uh, properly diagnosed that subsequently came back to some semblance of life, as we know it, without neurological death. Um, Dr. Schumann has raised some important issues, other neurologists as well, and that uh, was the reason for the newer guidelines in 2010 for the, from the American Academy of Neurology, and then in 2011 for a pediatric diagnosis of death. Those will continue to be revised simply because there's a constant move towards improving our abilities medically to diagnose death in two ways. One is safely and reliably, and two, promptly. We have removed and changed and, uh, the specifics I don't think are important, but uh, they will continue to change and improve, and we're looking forward to that and to people like Dr. Schumann for um, uh, pinching us to move forward in, in that respect. 
Um, today's conference is not so much about that, although it's certainly relevant. It's more about the, the, the approach, uh, the moral approach to this. And um, so I'm going to redirect uh, unless, uh, and, uh, and not offer myself up for questions on this, if that's sufficient. Oh, uh, uh, Professor DeLauro, is that, uh, did that answer? No, that's fine. Okay. Mike. Yes. Let's make a quick comment um, that uh, Dr. Schumann is a very good neurologist. Um, uh, I don't know that it, that affects the professional responsibility of the clinician concerning the use of life-sustaining treatment. Um, the clinician's responsibility is to use these treatments in order to um, provide a useful, indicated um, therapy. And if the prognosis is such that uh, no meaningful uh, thinking will occur, um, there is no professional responsibility to use the life-sustaining treatment under those circumstances. So whether the definition is altered or whether it um, comes under uh, scrutiny, the prognosis does not. None of these patients, though they might grow or though they might, um, uh, uh, there's one possible case where there was pituitary development. Um, the prognostic, uh, there's no change in prognosis concerning meaningful survival, and therefore uh, I don't believe it would in any way affect the professional's responsibility to eschew the use of life-sustaining treatment. Question down here. Hi, so my name is Ann Schneider, and I'm a sophomore at UCLA. That's my affiliation. Um, I have a really simple question, actually. Um, what is the criteria for determining the religious beliefs of someone who has passed away due to brain death or not? How do you know, and how do you know that the family's not lying about it? Great question. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. We, we actually have that question all the time. I'm sure our social workers are laughing the most there because um, so the, the way we normally determine it, I mean, from, from my perspective, especially if you're trying to figure out if someone in, is an Orthodox Jew or a Jew for whom Jewish law would be um, an important value in their life. So we usually determine that by, you know, we determine if they're a member of a synagogue Sometimes you can determine by external factors. We've had people come into our ICU who we do not even know their names, but we see, let's say, maybe like a long beard or tzitzis. You know, the we see something that gives us an indication like we should probably, it's probably the right thing to do to consider Jewish law with this patient. Um, so we sometimes do research. We've had patients for whom we've had to call around to different people in the community and ask about them. And it's the whole point we're trying to get to is, should we be taking into account Jewish law for this person, or should we just sort of allow the hospital to do whatever they think would be the standard medical practice for them? So it requires some research, and usually ask, finding out if they have a rabbi or finding out from their family, um, and really learning about them, yeah. There should be something more formal, like a will almost, like use of organ donation, that's a bad example, but yes, I will donate my organs to science, yes, I am religious in this way, or, but that's kind of relative, so. I, I, I would just, two comments. One, um, it's great that you do that, because New York and, and New Jersey law both clarify, because they both had considered imposing an obligation on the clinicians to inquire, an affirmative obligation to figure out what the patient's religious background. But in fact, with the way the laws are now, and this has been affirmed in both states, um, it's up to the family. So as long as you don't know anything about the patient's religion, you don't have any duty to accommodate until that is brought to your attention. Um, and absolutely, I'm sure that there are Jewish special advance directives where you can um, uh, record the, this preference among other uh, life stain treatment and post-death post preferences. Yeah, advanced directives are very important. Just one just interesting story. One time I had a patient who was, 
who was the father was the patient, and she and he was in horrible condition. I don't remember if he was. I don't think he was brain dead, but he wasn't able to speak for himself. And she was very demanding that he be treated in accordance with Orthodox Jewish law. And she herself, and I could see clearly, was what you would call an ultra Orthodox, you know, very religious woman. But as a chaplain, part of my job is to get to know people and to listen well. And it turned out that, um, as she sort of confided in me, that what happened was that she had converted and she became Orthodox herself, but her father was not Jewish, the patient was not Jewish. And that became an interesting dilemma. Do we tr we were, we we're being demanded to treat a patient in accordance with Orthodox Jewish law, assuming that that's what he would want, when actually it turns out he's, the patient is not Jewish, but the family, the daughter specifically, was. Well, thank you for that, Anna. Oh, I think uh, that's, that's a very good question, uh, actually. You so said, how do we know? I don't know if your language was uh, exactly if, if the criteria are, are they telling uh, the truth, but in the tradition I'm a part of, a Christ, Christian tradition to be sure, uh, you can consult and see if the person had a, had a pastor uh, to be sure if their, their membership is on a roll somewhere. Um, but really, you have to be in touch with their family and friends. Uh, and even within religions, I mean, to be sure, uh, people's views differ. So it's extremely important to, I think, capture that person's views uh, about the issues at hand. But that's a great question. I think it's real complicated. Yeah. There's a question in the back there. Um, Vicki Kind. Hi, I'm Vicki Kind. I work as a bioethics consultant. And I actually spend most of my time outside of the hospital working directly with families and patients out in the community. And actually something that I've designed recently is a brief form that could be an addendum to an advanced directive addressing this exact issue. Because instead of us guessing, are you religious? What is that religion? How do you enact your religion regarding your health choices? Why don't we just ask? You know, it's a set of questions that you could add to that advanced directive conversation that I think would really benefit all of these most difficult cases. Thanks very much for that important work. Thank you. Um, this is, I'm going to go back to some of the questions here as we await other people to step up. Um, this one is for Professor Pope. And uh, it says, about the California law, it seems to have a clause where there's no right to sue on the basis of the law or to litigate. And does that change your opinion about how it's actually going to be used in California? Well, I mean, <clears throat> you're right. So I, 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 that's not something I pointed out. Um, but there, yeah, so I think it, it's the D. So 1254.4D, which is the final subsection in the statute, says there's no private cause of action uh, for the statute, which means if the hospital says we're done on Wednesday, that's the extent of our accommodation period. You can't uh, sue under the statute to get um, to say you're you know go to court and say they're violating the statute and get an injunction. Um, but I, again, like as I pointed out, uh, you don't need to sue under the statute. Um, so you could get you could just bring the lawsuit uh, pursuant to other law, just like Jahai McMath did. So she got a TRO. Um, so I don't think it makes any difference that you don't have a private cause of action under the statute itself. I mean, if I could, I'll just one other thing. The other thing is, again, like I started the presentation, <coughs> clinicians are very legally risk averse. And the, I don't know who, I guess the Department of Health, I mean, some some hospital licensing authority, somebody, Again, you can thread in that whoever is supposed to enforce the statute, we're going to get in touch with them. Now, that might not be as scary as a, a private uh, civil lawsuit. But again, even though there's no private cause of action, somebody has the power to fine or you know, impose sanctions for violation of the statute. And the family can thread in to get in touch with those authorities. Thanks for that clarification. Oh, another question. Uh, uh, in, the, in the center there, who has not asked a question, and then maybe back. 
I just have a, a topical question. You mentioned, um, I think, uh, Dr. Pope, in your presentation, that the, there are other cultural groups that are often have issues around brain death by neuro, or death by neurological criteria. Buddhists, Native Americans, and Japanese Shinto. I'm not familiar with that, and I wondered if anyone could speak to what the issues are with those communities. I I can't. So I mean, I, I mean, I can't tell a story going back to Talmudic story, you know, uh, story, uh, parables. So I, 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 but those are um, the identity. In fact, you know, the, most uh, Catholics, most religions of the world have no problem with brain death. So it's just, those are always the few and far between exceptions. Um, but I can't tell the story about how, how it's inconsistent with the tenets of those faiths. Um, I think uh, we'll take uh, Ron's question first, and then uh, David's. Would the panel explain why we should avoid the term brain death? And if we are able amongst healthcare professionals to use that term, <coughs> do we then, <clears throat> by the public knowing that we speak of it, weaken the notion that brain death is death. Anyone want to take that on? I mean, very simply, I would say that uh, um, it's clear that there is confusion in the public. So there is a kind of semantic confusion that needs to be uh, articulated explain, many people refer to brain death when they speak about persistent vegetative state or when they speak about uh, coma. So, uh, I don't think that in itself the term brain death is equivalent. Perhaps it would be better to say uh, the person is dead by neurological criteria, uh, but I, I don't I don't see the reason why we shouldn't be using the term uh, once the term is being explained. Well, my impression was always that people feel that if you say brain death, you're saying, well, they're not really dead, they're just, their brain is dead. It's like, makes it, it's like wishy-washy. But from my perspective also, you know, when I mentioned those three possibilities of death in Jewish law, the two that include the brain, they're very, very different. It, it's not just, you can't just say brain death. Is it that which controls respiration or is it every single cell of the entire brain? So it's just not a, not a specific enough term. Also, I think there was a question from David Blake, and then I'm going to try to keep everybody in order. So I'll, I'll start this with the mic. So I'm pretty sure that when Alex Aper on his President's Commission issued his report, there's a microphone behind you, David. I'm pretty sure that when Alex Aper on the Commission issued his report 30 years ago, it thought it was settling the issue. So my question to the panel is, why isn't it settled? I mean, why, why is this issue intractable in American health care? And is its intractability in any way tied to the intractability of the feudal care issue or problem in American health care? I mean, why are we still talking about this 30 years after the President's Commission? But I, for, I'll just say this much. Um, I think this is, a, this is a species of medical futility dispute, right? Because the question is, is, is it worthwhile? Is there some benefit from continuing physiological support for this patient, right? That's the nature of, and, and for religious reasons or for, other, or for emotional reasons, people, the family in these disputes think, yes, there is a value or a benefit from continuing physiological support. And that's the core nature of a, of a medical futility dispute where the patient's not dead, but just PVS or, or something else. Um, and again, the clinicians think, no, it's non-beneficial. There's no benefit or value from continuing physiological support. It's permanently unconscious. The family thinks, yes, there is. So I think it's, it's, it, they're absolutely on the same continuum, if not exactly just a different a tiny little clinical footnote. This is just one type of medical futility uh, conflict. And, and why do we have them is because it, it, brain death just like uh, 
any other medical utility dispute is 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 value laden, right? The decide the fact that uh, Caperin and the and the committee drew the line there was a value judgment. Um, it could have been drawn somewhere else. And so, like with any value judgment, um, there's people have different values, and so it's it's never it's never going to go away. That I mean, that, it's, that's why it's intractable. And if I can offer from a neurologist's perspective, um, the vast majority of cases, that this doesn't arise as an issue. And so it's not an intractable, intractable problem. It's since it has, I would say it has problems at the edges and that are important problems and we need to address those. But by and large, people do get it once you explain to the family what's going on. These are the exceptions. I just wanted to jump in with the panel to echo Professor Pope's comments that futility uh, is inextricably tied in with, with, uh, with death by neurologic criteria, and I have a cute folk saying that illustrates that, um, not speaking from the perspective of being an Orthodox Jew, which I'm not, but uh, I'll give you a, a Yiddish folk uh, saying, which maybe some people in the audience might understand, and that's um, one that says, um, Helfen via Teuten Bankes. And I don't know if any of you know what that means, but to roughly translate it means that the, the treatment would help as much as putting hot cups on a dead body. And this is something which was understood by, uh, you know, shtetl Jews probably uh, 200 years ago that, that, that it would be futile to try to treat a dead body with this folk treatment. Okay, so yes, the idea of death and futility and even in our modern conception of brain death, these are, these are um, you know, uh, married. Question. Based on what was just said, related There's a microphone behind you. Sorry, based on what was just discussed, related to value and quality of life, what happens if the patient himself being asked such a question, what would he like to do when you reach a point of whether plugging him into machines or just let him go? And the answer of this patient at each different visit to the hospital, he's saying sometimes yes, sometimes no. What then should be the conclusion when the time comes and he cannot be asked? But we do know that he, at times, even most of the time, says, I want to stay alive. How do we handle the vacillating patient? Uh, uh, Dr. Winger? I, if, in fact, the patient is dead, he could have been consistent in saying he wants to be on machines, and we still turn them off. Legal, legally, I'll, it's actually an easy one. Legal, it's hard ethically, but legally, um, most recent in time, right? So whether, poll, look at the Pulse Law, look at the Advanced Directive Law, most recent in time, Trump. So you, you do a new Advanced Directive on the new admission, that constitutes a revocation of the earlier Advanced Directive. So most recent in time controls. Well, the panel makes it sound very easy. Thank you very much. <laughs> there are two questions over Three Those questions. Right. It's legal. <laughs> yes. Three questions. Uh, person's over here. And uh, let, let's let's start from uh, yes. Hi, I'm Shannon Peter. Uh, I'm a hospitalist attending at the West LA VA, and uh, I had a question, a little bit more on a technical manner. So I forgive it for the, uh, forgive me for this, but I think it might be helpful to some of the clinicians here. Um, you know, when we're talking about, and this is uh, for Dr. Shaner and uh, potentially for Dr. Wenger as well. When we're uh, discussing uh, making the next determination for a patient that the, clini the, the clinical team suspects may be uh, dead by neurologic criteria, um, and we uh, invoke apnea testing, one could imagine circumstances in which untoward events occur during the course of apnea testing. And for those of you who aren't familiar, it basically just involves um, allowing the patient's carbon dioxide level to raise to a certain amount, a threshold in which um, 
if they had any brainstem reflexes, it would challenge them to spontaneously breathe. So during the course of that, you can imagine a pneumothorax or um, a cardiac arrhythmia or other kind of untoward events happening. Um, and you know, when you're bringing in uh, Professor Pope, the risk aversion of many clinicians, it actually you know, brings us to a point where some might feel that even doing the apnea testing, as Dr. Wanger had mentioned, was in fact a directive of a hospital to determine dead versus alive. Even doing the apnea testing, if it were to have such an event, even if the event were happening to a corpse, um, it might actually uh, lead to a real uh, traumatic experience from the family's perspective, and also even potentially some ramifications towards the rest of the clinical team. So what do we do in the case of an apnea test which becomes complicated? Go ahead, Dr. So Wenger. This is an issue that actually gets raised relatively often, and our neuro neurocritical care specialists uh, are quick to tell us that there is no evidence that harm has ever occurred uh, because of an apnea test. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know. And I think that that's part of the reason that the uh, 2010 guidelines specifically consider the aborted test with um, alternative approaches. I, th I think that's a sufficient answer to that question. I'm going to give uh, uh, time over to the audience. <coughs> I'm sorry, did we answer your question sufficiently? I better ask. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Um, okay. I, I know that there are guidelines to abort the apnea test, but I was just wondering what would happen in cases where um, some type of event happened that triggered the apnea test. Uh, well, I would say that there, there's no guarantee that a family will not litigate for any reason at all. When you perform according to standard of care and you apply the apnea test, which does not require written consent or verbal consent, you're following standard practice. There's a risk to standard <coughs> practice of all kinds, including blood draws. This is one where we allow uh, the, the standard to go forward. I might just add that it's the physician's responsibility not to perform something that the physician feels might be harmful. Therefore, if a physician believed what you said, then it would be incumbent upon her or him not to perform the test. Mm -hmm. if I, well, actually, it, there's one other little tricky thing here, and that's that, you're right, if you comply with the standard of care, um, then you can't be sued. But you can still be sued for violation of informed consent. Now, normally, um, the protection, in other words, it's an inherent risk, right? Doing the apnea test has not, you, the risks don't come from any malpractice, they're inherent to doing the apnea test. Normally, the reason you get, you don't uh, get sued for inherent risks, not, you know, these are not negligently caused risks, is because you, you told the patient that that might happen, and they, uh, but as Dr. Wenger suggested, you're not getting informed consent for apnea tests. That's untested, right? So then the, they would say, well, I know you didn't, you didn't there was a harm that resulted from the apnea test, and I know it wasn't a result of malpractice, but I wish you had told me that that could result from the apnea test. In other words, the claim would be, you should have obtained my informed consent for the apnea test. And that's, I, I don't, and then, that, that we, and then we would have a definitive answer one way or the other about whether or not you do or do not need informed consent to perform an apnea test. So I, anyway, I think there's a small sliver of potential exposure uh, there. Next question. By the way, uh, you can do ancillary testing in place of the apnea challenge, too. So, I mean, that's something that's written to the brain death guidelines. My name is Grace Wee. I'm a, actually a pediatric intensivist and also at Loma Linda University and um, also um, the clinical ethics service. One thing that can be very distressing for uh, clinicians who take care of patients who have already been declared dead by neurologic criteria is knowing exactly what are the limits of care that are to be provided for these patients who have already been legally declared dead. Um, you know, so do, what are the limits that you think um, that, that are reasonable? Um, do they include intensive therapy such as emergent surgery for, say, abdominal decompression? Or do they, you know, does it, is it just a burden benefit calculation or where do we draw the line? We have some attendings who feel very intensely that um, even, in, um, even frequent blood monitoring for electrolyte disturbances, for example, would be too burdensome. 
I want to just clarify the question. This is in a patient who's been diagnosed as dead by neurologic criteria, and you're asking what other therapeutics uh, would be disproportionate? If, so in a, in a situation where the family has disputed the diagnosis of brain death, um, you, there is you know, this law that says that reasonable accommodation should be given to the family. Reasonable has been discussed in terms of time, um, but not in terms of the level of, of therapy that is provided. I'm not going to say care because we always care for our patients, but there are different levels of therapy that can be provided and that the family intuits is less than prior to this declaration. All right, so does reasonable accommodation include the treatment of uh, additional comorbidities as they de develop in patients who are dead? Um, well, I mean, I, I mean, I'm just, I'll let, I don't know what the, the practice, you know, but the statute clearly says only cardiopulmonary support. It clearly says nothing else, you know, suppressors, uh, all the stuff that, most of the stuff that Jahai's getting, right, would, is not required. Um, so I think, I mean, I, I, and I don't know the clin you know, how you implement it on, uh, clinically, but the statute seems pretty clear um, in terms of uh, clarifying that all sorts of needed or, indi you know, what would otherwise be indicated medical interventions are not required. I can tell you in the, in the Orthodox community when we have these cases, that, you know, even though people, are, we still consider the patient to be al alive by Jewish law, people are, are reasonable and they understand that this person is not necessarily going to, um, you know, walk out of the hospital. And so we, we usually distinguish between basic, their basic needs that we want to continue to provide nutrition, hydration, oxygen, and more aggressive treatments, which we would generally not, not initiate. And, um, you know, people recognize at that point that it's not, that it's not appropriate to be involved in aggressive <coughs> treatment for patients. And, and, you know, we oftentimes, like you mentioned about the apnea test, we believe that these patients are even more fragile, and we agree that oftentimes it's better, it's better to not do anything aggressive to them because that might actually hasten the death. It's my impression that clinicians have little, uh, that it's very clear that you would offer absolutely everything that you would do for a dead body, which means respect and cleanliness and everything that you would do there, plus the cardiovascular support. And I think that, that the confusion often arises is that in the next room, you have someone who's dead by neurological criteria being prepared to be an organ donor. And there you're doing everything possible to support those organs, including putting in new lines and supporting blood pressure, starting new medicines, and the nurse walks from one room to the next, and it's confusing. I'm going to have a couple questions here for Professor Lampkin just to switch gears on this, and this <clears throat> has to do with a couple of questions from the, uh, from the discussion that you offered. They're a little bit related. One is, says that uh, in my research, I've encountered the expectation for family inclusion and collective decision making. At the same time, I've also encountered a, string, a strong sense of privacy on the, past, on the part of the individual, um, not sharing with the larger family the severity of the illness, or in fact, even the fact that the person is ill. How do you reconcile this with the a family dynamic and the need for community support that this individual sees is common in the African Arab American community? It's a great question. And you might not be able to uh, reconcile that uh, tension. Uh, in one of the slides we talked about, I uh, spoke about the diversity uh, among uh, African Americans, and you always have to account for that uh, diversity. And so, uh, different families, of course, function very differently, and some people are uh, very, very private, uh, even uh, to their uh, family. So in that situation, I think you have to respect that patient's uh, autonomy and that patient's sense of, of privacy. Um, but perhaps as a general practice and maybe a starting point, always give at least some consideration when uh, addressing African Americans that there may be a family dynamic that one needs to uh, take 
uh, serious. So I think that's covered under the diversity within uh, the community. And you just got to be mindful that one can go actually either one of those ways. It's, it's not set in stone. And since you have the microphone, there's a related question. Someone wants to know if you use the word passed on instead of the word dead when you're explaining this to individuals from an African American community, is that better or is that worse? And do they understand passed on as the way we understand death? Or is, is it actually a completely different meaning? It's another great, uh, great question. Um, my colleague right next to me, he, 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 he mentioned um, his reluctance to use euphemisms. And it's, it's actually something to that. And I hadn't thought about that uh, at first. But here again, we was getting at this tendency. I think a lot of African Americans understand this language of passed on, and for them, for so many of them, it means dead. I mean, that's what it uh, means to them. And I was attempted to respond to this, this, this notion of brain death. I think it would be better, in my view, to say passed on and to say brain dead. I think it would create more uh, confusion. But let me be clear. I think providers must be as clear as possible when you're uh, communicating uh, death. And again, I think uh, here, what I was trying to get at in the talk, here uh, highlights the importance for understanding your patient, patients being in conversation and in tune uh, with your patients to know what kind of language actually communicates. And I think that's the goal, is to communicate. And so whatever language uh, communicates to the patient, if it works, if it's certain, um, then I would affirm that and support that. One last question up in the back. Hello, my name is Mario Carrillo. I'm from One Legacy. We're the local organ procurement organization. I know that topic's been discussed a little. I'm a family care specialist. I've worked with hundreds of families over almost 10 years now. And a lot of what you've all been discussing is very important. To tag on to what um, you just shared, it is very important. Communication does not happen often enough. I can't tell you how many times I've come up to a family and asked them if they understand. If I ask them, do you understand what brain death is? They say yes. But if I ask them for their understanding, an open-ended question, they truly do not understand what it is. And I'm not saying every physician is this way, but we come in, we have the time to sit there with them, sometimes for hours, depending on the hospital policy. But it is key. Um, the culture, I think, does need to change. The term brain death is uh, very confusing. I've had families ask me, oh, if the brain has died then, can we transplant the brain so they can come back? So it is a very confusing uh, term to the families. I think death by neurological criteria is, or however you want to phrase it, some variation thereof, is a lot better for the family. Um, there's less confusion. Um, you know, where I do see a cultural change is in pediatric units. The physicians are there, they, they alternate, they're there on a regular consistent basis, um, and they do take extra time with the families. And I see that that communication, as you mentioned, is key. Uh, Over-communication is actually key. They're in a state of shock, disbelief, and grief. And oftentimes, understanding is very different from accepting. Um, so there is a big disconnect there. And although they're hearing it, they're not processing it, and logic goes out the window. Um, so I am happy to be here and happy to hear all the things that have been discussed. Um, these are things that I've seen for years now, and uh, I'm glad that it's being brought to the forefront so that people can acknowledge it and uh, hopefully make a cultural change to really um, dedicate time with these families. You know, I know it's tough for us. It's just a day for us and our job, but it's a day they'll never forget. And so it's something that we have to be mindful of. That they're never going to forget how they were treated. I was at a hospital on Thursday where the family's perception was that their loved one was shot. They, it was a gunshot wound. They felt that their loved one wasn't treated in the, OR, in the ER for an hour and a half, was bleeding out, and they didn't treat him until he coded. They coded him three times. We come to support them after they've been told their loved one's brain dead. And at that point, they're angry. They're angry at the treatment that they felt they did not receive. And why would they want to give and donate when they feel they haven't been given the proper respect and dignity? So 
This is just one example of many that I could share with you. Uh, I know we don't have all day, but I can share so many different stories with you. Uh, but the key thing is communication. I, I think over communication is a cultural change that needs to take place to help these families. And there will be extraordinary circumstances such as the ones that are mentioned. But like you said, this is 1% of the population. It's far less that have these uh, outlying problems. So those are outliers, but in general, communication is very key. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Juan Carrillo, for sounding that call to better communication for all of us. And thanks to all of you for remaining for the really important closure for this very helpful meeting. Uh, I think with continued collaborative effort on determining death, our uh, communities will be able to find paths towards peace. And I think perhaps, Paul, do you have anything else to say? <clears throat> uh, just uh, on a concluding note, I want to um, I want to recognize that Dr. Deloro is going to make an announcement about a upcoming conference. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to capitalize on the fact that everybody's here, and uh, I want to say that uh, one of the conversations that have emerged uh, recently at the consortium was a conversation concerning the participation of healthcare professionals in torture. Um, and so we were hoping with the Bioethics Institute to come up with an evening dedicated to that particular topic. We can be too specific about the date uh, for now, but simply to say that it will be sometimes on the third week of uh, April. And so uh, if any of you will pay attention to our own uh, calendar, and uh, has an interest in uh, reflecting on this topic, this will be the next topic that we will be talking about. Thank you again for coming.